It's now time for the news. My name is Pakwesi Shandoff. Government is fighting back accusations that the Ghana Petroleum Corporation has caused financial loss to the state parliament's Mines and Energy Committee on Tuesday interrogated GNPC's management over a gas supply deal with Gensa Energy, according to civil society groups in Mani Africa and the African Center for Energy Policy, ASEP, Ghana buys Ghana gas, Ghana buys gas, I beg your pardon, for $95.8 million and sells to Gensa for $43.5 million. Deputy Energy Minister Mohamed Amin says that the CSO's claims are, however, misleading. The agreement between GNPC and Gensa, uh, which is the subject of uh, public interest, I think that it is important we, we understand it. Uh, some of the headlines uh, you read uh, are not factual, you know, and they do not help. When you have done analysis, so-called independent analysis, you need to put it against the facts. And the only way you can get the facts is to talk to the institutions that are involved. Otherwise, uh, it, it can be misleading, and uh, people will form an opinion on uh, misleading uh, statements. And this is why I am very happy that Parliament has shown interest in this. Our Parliament is a very responsive Parliament, and the Committee of Parliament, the, the Mines and Energy Committee, uh, has met uh, with GMPC and the Ministry of Energy, who provided all the answers they they, they want for the questions uh, relating to the allegations that have been made by Imani and, and, and Asset. And uh, uh, we know that they are going to scrutinize uh, this agreement and the questions we have answered, the answers are going to be uh, put to test. And then in due course, the nation will be informed as to uh, whether what we did is in the interest of our country. Such headlines can be misleading. You know, when you say that Ghana is losing 1.5 billion, I mean, and the analysis doesn't support that, then you are misleading the public. And so it is important you talk to the agency involved so that they will open the, the books to you. And GNPC is ready. They are available to open the books to whoever has concerns about that, that agreement. Uh, the fact that they are here explaining to parliament, you know, <laughs> means that they are not afraid to open the books. Parliament is a representative of the people. And so if we can open the books to uh, Parliament, uh, why not the public? Minority spokesperson on the Mines and Energy Committee, John Ginapo, says it's too early for government to seek to clear GNPC of any wrongdoing. We just had a very long session with GNPC. We've asked a lot of questions, interrogations. Some have been answered. Some are pending. We've asked for some information that they couldn't provide at the meeting. And so we have directed that GMPC should make all those informations available to us. The financial analysis underpinning the agreement, the analysis in terms of the investment decisions. We're also aware that Ghana Gas is deeply involved. And so we've decided that we ought to summon Ghana Gas to also appear before us I'm clear in my mind that there are some institutional overlaps and there are some turf war issues that ought to be addressed with. And so clearly, the committee would interrogate this matter to its logical conclusion. Our duty is to ensure that we get to the bottom of it. Our duty is to ensure that the state is not shortchanged. And I can assure you that we will do everything within our capacity to get to the bottom of this matter and to ensure that the ordinary taxpayer is safeguarded. And so it's too early for the minister to draw such conclusions. We've had serious issues, especially with capacity charges, with payments that we are making when we are not consuming all the pipeline charges. We are well aware that Jensa wanted to construct a 12-inch pipeline, but Ghana Gas decided that they should rather construct a 20-inch pipeline. Why would Ghana Gas do that? What are the underlying assumptions? Where are the gas volumes? We're going to interrogate all that. And so it's work in progress and we shall continue to deal with this matter. Meanwhile, Chairman of the Committee, Samu Atachan, says they have invited Ghana Gas to appear before the committee next week, after which they will come to a final conclusion. Well, let me tell you that uh, it's work in progress. It will be too premature for me to come to conclusions. The only thing which is a sore point for me is that I was thinking that before Imani and ASEP 
who put out into the public domain matters of this consequence. They should have made those matters referable to GMPC. Now, this is what we found. What are your comments? And they do incorporate their side of the story into the report. They didn't do that. So for me, it is too adversarial for comfort. We're just going to bring Ghana gas into the picture. We've slated them for Monday. After we've done a good and balancing act, I could speak to the issues. But for now, uh, it's a bit exaggerated. Away from that development, Circuit Court Judge Samuel Bright Aqua is asking the judiciary to take a strong stance against illegal mining ruling on a bill application for Aisha Juan. Justice Aqua said that the future of the nation is under threat. He indicated that the accused will remain in police custody as investigations continue. Ms. Huang and three others are accused of engaging in illegal mining and the sale of minerals without a license. A report by court correspondent Joseph Akable. There are two cases pending against Aisha Huang at the courts, one filed by the Attorney General himself at the High Court and another by police prosecutors at the Circuit Court. The Circuit Court had on September 14 remanded all four accused persons to police custody. Lawyers for the accused made another application for bail on Tuesday. Lead counsel Efa Date, who had earlier claimed the offence were not serious, continued in that regard. The media has overhyped this small matter of mining without licence and doing mineral sales without license. It's a small matter. It happens every day in Ghana. So I don't see why the media should even write an editorial on this matter. He told the court not even the president, the attorney general, or any other person can fault the court should it grant bail. He questioned why investigators needed more than a month to investigate a simple matter. Prosecutors, however, stated that investigations have revealed that the accused persons entered the country illegally. This, they argued, was sufficient basis for one to conclude that a grant of bail is not necessary. The judge dismissed the bail request and proceeded to make the following comments. This is an activity that is destroying our water bodies. Look at how it is destroying our forest. We, the humans, are complaining. The animals in the forest are suffering. It's very sad. If we should allow this to go on, Ghana Water Company Limited says they will soon shut down their machines. We will have to import water to drink. The courts and everyone must take a strong stance. A1 especially, how she entered the country. She can't even tell. If I grant her bail and tomorrow the case is called and she can't be found, what happens? The motion for bail is refused. The case is back in court on October 12th. For joining us from the circuit court, my name is Joseph Akable. Now, sachet water vendors and consumers in the Tichiman municipality of the Bono East region are complaining about the increase in the product price from 30 to 50 pesos. While the consumers are lamenting the effect of the increment on their finances, the new price, according to the vendors, has affected the sale of the commodity as they are currently experiencing a sharp reduction in their daily sales. Correspondent Anasabet now reports. <laughs> A sachet of uh, pure water or mineral water is sold here around 50 Ghana pesos. Well, to the sellers here, uh, they are heavily affected because buyers are not buying from them as they used to. A couple of them have, you know, have to switch the price lower than the 50 pesos. Some are selling it at 40 pesos, but still they claim it is affecting uh, their businesses. First, no, 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 we used to buy a bag of sachet water at 5 Ghana cities, and it's now 9 cities. And if we sell at 50 pesos, they don't buy. Some of the drivers here are even saying they'll start filling water in Ghana because they can't afford to buy a sachet at 50 Ghana pesos. It's affecting our sales in diverse ways because as you can see, it's a sunny day yes, and the people half, are not buying. Half, mark, mark, I went for That's half a bag of sashi water and I'm still carrying it. They are not buying as they used to. We buy the bag of sashi water at seven cities. In one in fridge at 10 Ghana 
can see this. If we sell it at 250 pesos, we run out of gas because we buy one at 7 gallon cities. It's affecting us a lot because we used to sell 5 or 6 bags initially, but now we can only sell between 1 and 2 due to the cost. Well, we've been speaking with some, you know, consumers here, and they've also been telling us how the increment of uh, the prices is impacting or having a toll on their lives. You know, we can't yes, buy so sexual water at 50 Ghana pesos. We beg you, kindly do something about it. I'm even tired of being an MPP faithful. I sometimes consume up to eight sachets in a day, and that means I'll spend four Ghana cities a day, and how much will I spend on food? How do you how do you be brave? To the sun say, we be juma. We be rap. We be me. It's zero day. One hundred. Now that we are heading towards the dry season, we may be consuming about ten sachets in a day. This is worrying. They are appealing to government and authorities to intervene to save the situation. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm planning for. I'm planning for. Yes, sir. We are appealing to authorities to do something about this, at least if there is increment on other commodities, not water. We beg them to do something about it. We are appealing to government to reduce the electricity tariffs, else we are going through a lot of hardships. So they should do something about the cost of drinking water. The best rabbi is here. One friend now, one young baby, can hear the my light and normness are two and getting here. What they are to talk to the man getting getting busy, no. And the bathroom is here. Yes, we are being here. From the the Chiman Lorry Station. My name is Anastasia. Reporting for joining us. The Minister for Tourism, Arts and Culture, Dr. Ibrahim Awal, is worried that Ghana is losing revenue due to the absence of large-scale parks for amusement and recreational purposes. Dr. Ibrahim Awal made the statement in a speech read on his behalf by his deputy, Mark Okrakumante, at the climax of the World Tourism Day in Uwa. Correspondent Rafik Salam has more. World Tourism Day is observed every year on September 27 with the aim of fostering awareness among the international community about the importance of tourism and its social, economic, political, and cultural values. This year's celebration themed Rethinking Tourism focuses on how we can accelerate tourism recovery through a collaborative engagement of all stakeholders around a shared vision to build a more sustainable, inclusive, and resilient sector. The official World Tourism Day celebration was held in Bali, Indonesia, to highlight the shift towards tourism as a crucial pillar of development. The national celebration of the event took place in the Upper West Region under the auspices of the Ministry of Tourism, Arts and Culture. Prior to the celebration, tours were organized to some tourist sites such as Nakoromox, Royal Cozy Hills Hotel, among others. The celebration was climax with a grand debut of chiefs, queen mothers, and major stockholders in the hospitality industry at the office complex of the Upper House Region House of Chiefs. As part of the celebration, Ghana has developed a sub team that promoting domestic tourism for wealth creation in communities to grow the interest of Ghanaians for tourism. Deputy Minister for Tourism, Arts and Culture, Mark Okrokumante, speaking on behalf of the sector minister, Dr. Ibrahim Awal, noted that revenues generated from the tourism sector took a nosedive following the advent of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
He however revealed the situation is getting back to normal. That is blessed with many natural, historical, and ecological tourist destinations, but it doesn't have enough large scale amusements and theme parks for recreational purposes. In 2019, the USA generated 22 billion US dollars from just amusement parks. Many tourists visit the United States yearly just to see and get a fun experience from these theme parks. Ghana used to receive a higher number of tourists in the pre-pandemic years and is gradually getting back to those highs as the country recovers from the pandemic. These numbers could double or triple if the country had large-scale amusement and theme parks located in various parts of the country. Fortunately, this plan is already underway with the construction of a large-scale water park in Ghana by a private sector group. This water park, when completed, will generate a lot of revenue and create job opportunities in the country, especially for women and youth. Dr. Ibrahim Awal opined that the country, especially the Upper West region, has swept of tourist size which are varied and well developed. What is hard about lacking is a sustainable program, project, and activities for their continuous development and promotion of domestic and international tourism. This end, the Ministry of Tourism, Art and Culture and its agencies have introduced these initiatives. The domestic tourism campaign dubbed Experience Ghana and Share Ghana aimed at increasing domestic tourism visits to, to tourist sites creating awareness, boosting domestic tourism experience, and reviving the culture of travel among Ghanaians and persons in the sub-region to consolidate our gains as reported by the Travel and Tourism Development Index Report 2021. Upper West Region Minister Dr. Abiz Bin Sali underscored the importance of the tourism sector, stating that it is critical as it stimulates economic growth. He used the Upper West Region to buttress his point. Tourism in the Upper West region strives and has registered growth over the years. There are an increasing number of decent accommodation and conference facilities and services. Tourist demonstration, such as which our community people sanctuary, the Bolu Slave Defense War, the Wana Palace, Nakori Asian Mosque, and other heritage sites continue to attract tourists to the region. Additionally, our beautiful culture, cultural heritage, premised on a relatively peaceful and comfortable environment, and our strategic location as a border region are consistent drawers for both local and international visitors. Reporting for the news, Rafik Salam. Now, some 58 junior high schools, in junior high school teachers, I beg your pardon, in the Ashanti region have benefited from asthma care training by the Pan African Thoracic Society and the School of Medicine and Dentistry of the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. It is aimed at providing basic training for teachers and school health coordinators on identifying children and adolescents with asthma in school. There's more on this report. World Lung Day. An annual event dedicated to focusing attention on respiratory diseases as a major cause of morbidity and mortality worldwide. The workshop, funded by the Pan African Thoracic Society, drew teachers from both private and public schools to deliberate on ways to remove stigma and barriers to asthma control and improve care in the school environment. Dr. Sandra Kwatoos is program director, and Dr. Haruna Mahama is a facilitator. We chose to interact with the school teachers and the school health coordinators for this event which is marking World Lung Day because we realized that from the achieving control of asthma in children in African study, which occurred in six other African countries of which Ghana was part, there's a very big number of children between 14, 12 and 16 years with asthma in the junior high schools who do not have an official diagnosis. They go to school every day. 
and some of them have symptoms and are present in school. So we felt that we could um, talk to the school teachers, talk to the school health coordinators and empower them, give them more information on what childhood asthma is, the symptoms of asthma, how to identify the children with asthma, and even how to be the link between the children and the health system, we, the health teams that manage them. Uh, some proposals that we wrote to the uh, Pan-African Thoracic uh, Society, uh, where they have an, uh, a grant that normally they give every year for the celebration of the World Lung Day. So as part of the proposals, we actually wrote on how to educate teachers and then um, school health coordinators in our junior secondary schools on how to help in the management of asthma. So how they identify the signs and symptoms. If a child in the school is having asthma, how they go about it. And then also with importance of, uh, to the stigma that normally is associated with it, how to deal with the stigma. So we actually sent a proposal and then we got uh, the grant that uh, actually enabled us to uh, have this uh, program today. Municipal School Health Coordinator, Reverend Emmanuel Addo, was optimistic the workshop will help with the management of the cases in the schools. I um, benefited a lot because at first uh, most of our teachers didn't know how to manage the situation. So um, sometimes it will be a problem for the school. But now, once you've gotten the first-hand experience in it, if such can happen in the, any of the children, they can even manage it. Reporting for Joy News, Kwesi Debra. That's all for the news. For more, log on to www.myjoyonline.com. My name is Paco Sishandov. The show continues with Benjamin Akaku and Papito CBD. Stay. <laughs>Good morning. Uh, who says good morning to whom? <laughs> How are it's you? It's good to see you. Good to see You're you looking too. all colorful this morning, Matthew. Thank you too. very much. Or should I call you Ben? Yes, um, I'm I looking. Right. Yeah. And today your bracelet thingy, uh -huh. your cord thingy, uh -huh. your eye thingy is matching the, the upper part of your... My dress. Uh, yeah. I see. Who sews for you? Um, I've got two seamstresses. Uh, what's, oh, I don't know their names. I forgot. What's her name? Oh, gosh. But one is Auntie Evelyn. She's just here in Kukumemle. Okay. Uh, her store is... Shouts to Aunt, Aunt Evelyn. Yeah, Auntie Evelyn by... <laughs> what's that food place? Top Taste. Okay. So she's by Top Taste, Auntie Evelyn. Mm. And then uh, Arisa Kotro, and she's in Jolu. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think this jacket is somewhere from Italy, but I can't vouch Ish. for it. Yeah. We are pushing Made in Ghana. Made in Ghana, you are telling us about Italy. You know, I'm an African print person, but because of the texture of the show... We must, we must do the formal bit. And, you see, uh, so, so that's, that's where I disagree. Because of the texture of the show, you, what does you, that you, mean? You, you disagree. No, no, what does that mean? Does that mean that African print is not fit enough to be on no, a formal it's, show? It's, it's not not fit enough to be on a formal show. Have you seen me on Fridays rocking it, jackets with African print? I'm asking before? you a question. So what does it mean? Um, it when you say the texture and what? What, what we... You know, TV is all look and feel, right? Please what? TV, uh -huh. look, feel, context, show, um, and what we want to put out there. So, so you're trying it's, to... It's a choice. It's a choice to do this rather than... So it's a it, deliberate so there are choice options. to sideline African prints. No, because definitely you're not. Because that African print doesn't suit the style you're of the show. You're an African prince, aren't you? I'm, I'm an African prince, but I have been told not to wear it. <laughs> I've been given feedback that it is not uh, part of the show. Anyway, so there's a I get to do benefit. this. I get to do uh -huh. this Monday to Thursday, and on Friday I segue, I weave into 
African prince. And, and don't you love my Af Friday African prince? You love them, don't you? You are. And you, and you want to do you them. Are, you, you want to do them the whole week. Yeah. No, why not? Anyway, it's a conversation we could have even in the public sector. Uh, they would usually do this on Fridays. I don't know what Dr. Sasanti thinks. He actually joins uh, the conversation. He is a uh, head of the Center for European Studies at the University of Ghana. Doc, a very good morning to you. Do we have Dr. Sasante joining the conversation? Right here. I'm here. Good morning. Good morning, Doc. Great. Doc. Good to hear from you. Yes. I, 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 this conversation, it's an interesting note. We didn't plan this. But I know in the, the Nkrumah era, there was all of this nationalistic feel, which by and large, I think, has been lost and donning our own and everything. But even in the public sector, you would realize that we're restricted to Fridays. Do you think there should be a paradigm shift in that, in that regard? Oh, certainly. Mm. Uh, that idea actually was mooted by um, Mr. Kwesio Seheji and then, um, you know, um, Mr. Alan Chiramating uh, crown it all. Uh, I would have thought that we would continue and then move it from a day to two or more. Or why not even the whole week? I am an unrepented African. You always you remember in class, I always put on my smoke. Mm -hmm. African <laughs> print, and I'm in forever. Uh, the reason being that we can, nobody will patronize our commodities. We have to do and show the example in the world. Any conference I attended around the world, I'm always in my smoke. Take it or leave it. So. I believe that we can showcase this and make it part and parcel of uh, the things that we do here so that we, our industries, can become attractive, develop, and create employment for our people. We need that than always relying on foreign, you know, goods and all that that come to destroy our cottage industries. Interesting points, uh, Mapito. And uh, maybe right before we get in, it's also been pretty wet this month of September. Mm -hmm. It's been rain back to back. Was it yesterday you were engaging um, the meteorologist? Yeah, Joshua Samoa, a yes. senior forecaster. Mm. And we're expecting more rains this week and into next week. So prepare uh, accordingly your party plans for this week. If you have a party, a wedding, make sure that you have a... Plan B to have a venue that is an indoor venue. So more rains, more floods, more we will do something about the the, floods. the, the way you you easily say more rains, more floods. Um, almost as though you had given up on the system, knowing that the rain will come with the floods and Definitely. with the floods devastation. Yeah, and like <clears throat> at this moment, like there's nothing. In fact, it's not that there's nothing we can do, but like I'm honestly, personally, I'm tired of talking. Every year, uh, we will do something. Or oh, Nadmo rushes with some sort of rescue items and all of that every single year. And then the president or whoever will come and tell us that, oh, we're working on it, we're working on it. Uh, we'll drain this uh, river, we'll do this, we'll do that. Charlie, they should continue doing it. Doc, right before we get into the papers, uh, the rains are still with us uh, this month of September. It appears every morning now it rains. And you know what that leads to. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's an age-old problem. I, I think all of us have become a bit inured or tired of discussing it. Are we ever going to get out of this, do you feel? No, we are not ready. We have seen this time and again. Mm -hmm. What stories have even to be done? When I was a journalist, we wrote all stories. You people are continuing talking about it every day. When would it change? Mm. Uh, the least said about this, the better. Let's move on into other business. Anyway, I guess despondency has crept in. Let's check out some stories from uh, the papers. We'll start with the Daily Graphic today. Gold firms begin sales to Bank of Ghana. 125,000 ounces expected in the last quarter. There's also land scarcity impedes agenda 111 in Greater Accra. And there's MIAA empowers men to examine women for breast cancer. And Aisha Huang, others slapped with an additional two-week custody. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Let's check out some of those stories very quickly. And uh, I'll do the one with, uh, in respect of the gold firms and then the land scarcity and the breast cancer bit. So gold producing companies in the country have started selling gold to the 
Bank of Ghana under the Domestic Gold Purchase Program. The companies which are members of the Ghana Chamber of Mines will, between now and December this year, sell about 125,000 ounces of gold to the Bank of Ghana. Now, last year, the central bank announced that it would begin to hold parts of its reserves in gold as it sought to shore up its foreign reserves. Um, the sale is expected to strengthen the city and halt the rising inflation. In all, there are 10 mining companies that will sell gold to the Bank of Ghana under the deal. The firms are Newmont Ghana, uh, Ghana Gold, which operates the Achim and Ahafu mines, Goldfields, which operates the Takwa and Aboso mines, Anglo Gold Ashanti, Obwase, Anglo Gold Ashanti, Idiaprim, uh, Perseus, Asanko, Golden Star, Wasa, and uh, Ademus Gold Services. The central bank will buy the gold in CDs at $1,600 dollars per ounce at the Bloomberg exchange rate of 10.3 uh, Ghana CDs to the dollar. And so uh, that, that is in consonance with what we were told by the Bank of Ghana to start, you know, shoring up our economy by purchasing gold like the Americans have it in Fort Knox, you know. So uh, the monetary value of gold, keep it there, try to use that to also be a benchmark and a, give some stability to our economy. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to you briefly, Doc. I just want to bring up the other stories and then you can react to them. Let's go to page 13. Two of those stories are actually there. So the Great Accra Regional Minister Henry Kwarty has expressed dissatisfaction at the slow pace of work on the Agenda 111 hospital projects in the region. He attributed the situation to the unavailability of land in most of the assemblies, while some of the available land uh, was entangled in litigation. Last year, the government announced that it had secured $100 million, uh, dollars, that is, for a starter fund through the Ghana Investment Infrastructure Fund for the commencement of an Agenda 111 district, specialized and regional hospitals across the country. Your take on these two stories. So, gold firms have begun selling uh, to the Bank of Ghana instead of simply shipping them out. And that is also in a bid to stabilize our economy. And then land scarcity. We've been told about Agenda 111. We've been told that these hospital facilities will be constructed. But then we find out that now there's no land even to do this. Quick reactions? Hello, Doc? We may have lost uh, Dr. Asa Asante. Hello, Doc. Can you hear me? All right, we've lost uh, Dr. Asasanti. He'll come back. He'll yeah, join he us. Definitely will. I hope the rains are not messing around with that. What you know how it is. When it rains, it's not just the electricity that could go off. Your internet, internet. could also be very yeah. sketchy or dodgy. But how do you react to this? Maybe the, the land scarcity bit. What all this was going to, and now all of a sudden there's... But it's so funny that there's, such a, there's an increase in apartment blocks. Mm. But you're saying that there's a land uh, scarcity uh, in terms of uh, getting the, the hospitals. So it's just like so funny that you're giving private developers mm. land to build these apartment blocks and restaurants and whatever. But the stuff that we need or the stuff that you promised, you can't provide. But this could be land, land that already isn't government land or isn't land that government has gone for. You know, a lot, lots of individuals, the chieftaincy institutions, mm. gun. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, the chiefs have their own pools of land, some of which, uh, most of which people say are already gone. Mm -hmm. And then there are individuals with their land. I mean, government can't, can't interfere with that unless they want to go a buy. You, you get it. Yeah. But in this instance, I'm just asking myself. So if we said we're going to construct the hospitals, 111 of them, and we hadn't even mapped out where, where we were going to, mm -hmm. that's what comes to mind at this point in time. It's almost as though it were a knee-jerk reaction. We'll do it, and now all of a sudden we are trying to now do we'll it, and we realize fix it. there are impediments. Yeah. That's, that's what I see there. Mapito, mm -hmm. let me wrap on this one. I think as for Aisha Huang and being slapped with another uh, two-week custody, it's, it, it, we're already in the no yeah, on that yeah. one. Mm -hmm. But the MIAA empowering men to examine women for breast cancer. Now, okay, let's that one is the story I want to get into. Please, let's hear. Mm -hmm. So a project that seeks to consciously empower men to fight against the rising cases of breast cancer in the country has been launched with a clarion call on men mm -hmm. to join the fight against the deadly disease. Four. Dubbed Men in Arms Against Breast Cancer Initiative. That's the MIAA. Mm -hmm. 
The project seeks to develop and demonstrate practical models that will improve early detection and treatment of breast cancer in women through the help of men. men. Okay. So a month-long series of activities for the initiative will start in October, which is the month set aside for uh, awareness and the promotion of the detection of breast cancer. But this is what it means. Okay. Um, so the MIAA, put together by two NGOs, is going to create awareness of the disease by building the capacity of 100,000 men. Mm -hmm across the country with skills in massaging the breast of their partners to promote the early detection of any irregularities in their breasts. I also think... What do you make of it? Uh, before I, I comment on that, I also think they should um, start a campaign where women will also detect... Don't, don't go there. <laughs> don't you even go there. Oh, how? I, I hope you're not going there. Tit for tat. Tit for tat. Tit for tat. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Tit for tat. But, I mean, for those who are in that conjugal union, they would obviously, you know, have access to their partners. And I think it's but, only but logical that... It makes sense. Whatever, once you are, you know, consummating, getting intimate with your partner, yeah. you also take note of... Such things. What what's could be happening. I, I, think it's, I think it's... You don't just go on a wild... It's a great move because... Honestly speaking, as a woman, we hardly ever like touch and fondle our breasts. Mm. You understand? Uh, so if you have a partner, if you are married or in a very long-term relationship and you're obviously with your partner, I'm sure he can do that uh, mm. for you. Mm. Yeah. If you're married or a long-term um, well, 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 my producer, uh, Derek Ekwasan, definitely is married. I'm yeah. sure he will take this very serious. I'm sure he will. I, I want to believe he will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, if he doesn't, I'll have to reiterate, re-echo. That's right. And ensure that, you know... He, he makes and he takes care of the, the breast. And, and we'll have to inquire whether he's doing his, his job. Yeah. As usual. Did you follow the Black Stars match? No, I didn't. Okay, but so I, I, didn't watch, I didn't watch the yeah. one with uh, Brazil, but I watched the one with Nicaragua. And how they, was it? It was a pretty... Uh, rather good performance. They dominated the entire game. Mm -hmm. The only problem, they didn't take their chances and I feel there are still some, there's still some rustiness in terms of the flow, you know, defense to midfield, mm -hmm. midfield to, uh, you know, attack. And uh, I feel those are some uh, parts of the machine that needs more oiling so okay. that it can be you know, more efficient. But apart from that, it wasn't a bad outing. We, we should have netted many more because Nicaragua is so many places, you know, beneath us. I think we are 60-something and, and they are over 100, you know, on the <clears throat> FIFA rankings. So that is that. At least I watched it. Okay, well, let's see. We're, we're, we're looking forward to the Next, we face Switzerland. Uh, I, I hear they are in the top 10. So well, we really a have, because we met Brazil, mm -hmm. which is number one, and they thrashed us by three goals to nothing. Mm -hmm. We met Nicaragua, which is a rather bottom side. Though they've largely improved, mm -hmm. uh, we pipped them by a goal to nil. Now we go back into the top 10. Uh, let's see whether we can bamba with the big boys. With the big boys. Yeah. All right, let's go to the Republic Press now and Balmea on Ghana's economy. Tough days ahead, uh, but recovery is coming. Mm. Balmia on Ghana's economy says, tough days ahead, but recovery is coming. Up. He's re-echoing what the president has Very been saying. We just hope the recovery will come sooner. Yeah, and then uh, also on page later. six, uh, fans who booed Akufa at Global Citizen Festival lack home training. That's according to the NPP. And uh, 16 drivers uh, pay 24,000 Ghana cities in fines for violating road regulations. Yesterday, so, I was so, driving so, around town, right? Mm. And down Paris boys... Are the police really, visibility really team visible told you they are like tell it every corner so i got lost a bit right and i wanted <laughs> to make a u-turn but that u-turn is not um it's not an official it's not an unofficial u-turn right but as soon as i got to the traffic light i saw dumper boys and i was like actually no oh is I'm, that the new name for them now? Oh, yeah, yeah. or you you've given them the, giving them so that. the dvs yeah the or the dbs yeah dumper dumper boys. boys yeah so I but saw what happens to the boys. girls. So DBG, Dumper boys, boys and, and girls. girls. Uh -huh. Yeah, Dumper boys and girls. Yeah, man. So I saw them uh, at the traffic light, and I was like, you know what? Not today. Let me <laughs> not today. Let me just follow. <laughs> and I had to take the long turn. So big shout out to uh, Mr. Dumper. He's doing a very good job with this. Doctor, actually. Actually, doctor. George yeah, doctor. Dumper. He's doing a really, really good job. So 16 drivers pay 24,000. Uh, Ghana cities and fines for violating road regulations. We'll read that. And you are sick. That is according to 
Koku Anye Doho, who fires at Serun Ketia, and Aisha Huang denied bail, and Kaswa Toll both abandoned weeks after crash. Let's go to page four, where Baumea says tough days are ahead but recovery is coming and he's talking about the economy and this is the republic press okay so uh while visiting kenya to um end president ruto's inauguration a few days ago president, vice president baumia spoke about current global economic challenges and how ghana is coping okay so he highlighted the benefits of the african continental free trade area of which ghana is the location of its secretariat and how it will play a large part in Africa's continued economic growth. He continues to say that it is important that Africa trades by itself. We're very passionate about it and there are a lot of opportunities and potential to realize he mentioned this. So you also, are, when asked about the current economic challenge situation facing Ghana, specifically with high levels of inflation, Balmia emphasized it is a problem affecting all global economies following the global pandemic and Russia's invasion of Ghana's, of, of, of Ukraine. Okay, so what I've also noticed is that one thing about this um, government or this administration, when they're asked about a certain problem or the economy or whatever it is, even like, for example, the global festival, Bruhaha, right. they always have someone to blame. So they never, ever take full... Um, what's this thing called, like accountability, that, okay, yeah, that we've done A, B, and C, but it's always uh, my predecessor, my previous, uh, the NDC, mm. COVID-19. We never take responsibility. We never take We're responsibility. always passing the buck. Yeah, yeah, okay, but let's go to page six. You know, Liz Hayfon uh, yesterday said that it was disrespectful that the youth um, was booing at the president. So the NPP, fans who booed uh, Akufada at Global Citizen Festival lack home training. That's what they're saying, and that is the deputy communications director, for the uh, new patriotic party, Jennifer Queen, who has said those who marked the president, Nana Kufado, at the just ended global festival, um, lack home training. And we spoke about this, obviously, and I disagree with, with, with them um, who say that the youth lack home training. It was just an avenue for them to vent their frustrations, and that's what they did. I'm wondering, though, you know, uh, Nancy Pelosi, Nancy Pelosi yeah, yeah, yeah. was also booed, yeah. right? I'm wondering whether in the United States, those who booed her also lacked uh, home training. Like I said, I have, I'm somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. I feel like I, I, I've made mention of, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't go to a function and boo, you know, my president. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, <sighs> there's something. And it's not necessarily home training. I would just restrain myself. Yeah. Unless it were something egregious. But I also I feel you uh -huh. cannot take it away from people when they want to vent. Because look, it's, we were talking about this a short while ago. Sometimes when people, the, the reason they are allowed to demonstrate and the rest, mm -hmm. if you don't allow them to do some of these things, they may keep up pent up feelings and it might explode in a way you don't want to see. Let the people way, express yeah. themselves. I feel that is what happened, genuinely. I have followed, I've listened to you, I've listened to other people who were at the event because yeah. I wasn't there, so yeah. I didn't want to give any prognosis. And I, I have watched videos of how the thing happened. Mm -hmm. This didn't look orchestrated. It didn't appear as though it had been planned. It appeared rather spontaneous. Yeah. Uh, if the young people are upset and like you see the thread on Twitter where people were saying, we're going here to drown our sorrows. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. we didn't want a reminder. That is oh, how God, they sorry. felt. I, I, I don't see how you can, Do you know. That. But, but, but let's bring in Doc. Uh, Doc's uh, reaction. Doc, I'm sure you've been following the news. And, you know, a lot of people are saying that, well, the MPP is saying that the fans who booed Akufada at the Global Citizen Festival lack home training. Your reactions to that? Yeah. Um, if we look at all that's happening, Mm -hmm. The issue of political culture. In political science, there's something we call political culture. What is it? It's the, the, the attitude of people towards political issues and political actors and political subjects. So actors like presidents, ministers, and mm -hmm. all that. What are people's attitude towards them when there is something that they feel uncomfortable with? All right. Mm -hmm. What are the attitudes towards political issues? All right. There are three types of them we have what we call participant political culture, okay. where people believe that, look, they matter in the state, and for that reason, if you are governing, you are not governing well, they have every reason to voice out 
and then express their grievances and all that. Mm. That is one aspect. Another aspect is that there are subject political officers. They are passive. They don't care who about what happens. Once a while, they come and they go away. Then we have parochial paro political culture, where people believe that they don't even belong. For that reason, look, they don't care what happens, happens and all that. Mm. In every state, you have, you know, a combination or there is a mix, admixture, if you like, of all these factors. There's no state where you can have what one, you know, one aspect of the political culture. You have all the three, but some are moderate, some are very high, some are least. All right. People have done research, and in America, it shows that you have what participant political culture very high mm. compared to the others. If you look at UK, it's a balance. All right, and then the rest of them. I am happy that Ghanaians are now having a taste of what political culture is, yeah. all right? Yes, and that is, it's, it's not about your training, it's about where you come from and not, no. Let us remember that people pick these things from around the globe. You recall Mr. You know, uh, Trump, who was booed in a, a sports uh, game when he attended and all that. Uh, yes, so when you look at it, it tells you that, look, there is something that political elites need to do. One, you need to research into the society you find yourself, whether in your country, which of them, the three I've mentioned, is yeah. very strong, yeah. for which reason you want to work at. Which one is weak and which one is what? Even moderate. Mm -hmm. If you are able to get your finger on these things, you are able to address the problem in a way. Because why do you usher the president into uh, an area where mostly the people who are going to be there are in the youth? And where promises have been made that we will get this, we'll get this, we'll get that. All right, and these things are not forthcoming. You will see that pent up feeling coming out there. Then it's a function of what? Uh, the inability of the security to pick the signal and tell the Mr. President, no, the, uh, the, the, the forum is not appropriate for you, isn't it? So uh, these things. So, are... so just to clarify, this was a failure on the part of the president's team in terms of picking intelligence and knowing to... where he should go at what time. It was a failure. Yes, yes, right. yes, one. Another issue is the issue of research. The party has not done any research to know, you know, attitudes of people towards some of these things so that always you have what? A plan B or a solution. Yeah. I always say yeah. that you need a political officer who knows the terrain very well and all the time doing research to be able to what? Help the, uh, you know, the presidency to address some of these things. I, I mean, people just get into office and they have no clue as to how to go about these things. Obviously, one area that is also explained this issue is the issue of economy and governance. Mm -hmm. If you look at uh, choices that people make when they are selecting leaders, one of the variables, the first one, is the economy. So whenever there is a problem with the economy, all right, you see reactions in these forms, you know, booing, you know, demonstrations and whatnot. Mm. It gives a political signal, all right? So all the time, you must be able to what, address the economy uh, so well, so that you incur problems. Uh, yesterday, I was listening to a professor from University of Ghana Business School, fantastic professor, looking at the options for us and when we are going for this debt ray shuttling and all that, the dangers, the cost and benefit, if you like. And I tell myself, I say, wow, my feeling is that, look, uh, anytime you have a government which is not performing, the economies of this country might Okay. Oh, it appears we're losing Doc again. You know what? Because I wanted to find out from him. And, and I, again, when the ruling administration says these people were members of the opposition or people who are not in favor of the administration, it, there's been, it's been coming. Yeah. If you notice, the, there was a member of parliament who was, you know, roughed up. Then after that, we had the majority leader, Oseiche Mensa Bonsu, yeah. in Swami his own constituency, on the back of road issues. You know what they did to him? Mm -hmm. They literally drove him out, pelting his vehicle with um, sachet water and all yeah. of that. And it wouldn't be the first time. It, in, in fact, it's not restricted to this political administration. It has happened in the past. Yeah. So I am surprised that the tone is, oh, they are booing because they are members of oh, the yeah, opposition. Yeah, yeah. Because the NDC, at some point in time, people have been pelted, members of parliament have been booed and all of that. So I don't know whether it is a detachment from reality. But when we have Doc back, maybe we'll, 
we'll, we'll get into we'll what get, he thinks yeah. about that. What do you so more stories? What else do you have? All right, so I'll focus on two more stories uh, to wrap. The first one is Daily Guide, Lodina grabs cars cash from Nana. And okay. I'll shed some thought on this. So amidst the recent whining by former President John Romani Mahama that the state has neglected him by not paying his emoluments, his wife, former First Lady Lodina Mahama, has received two cars courtesy of the magnanimity of President Kufuado. The president made available the two brand new vehicles, Toyota Land Cruiser V8 and Toyota Camry for the comfort of the First Lady, all to be fueled by the state. The cars were delivered to her in August 2021, before Mahama's recent rants over his emoluments. And it goes on and on mm -hmm. and talks about the fact that the former president uh, had kicked against extending the same largesse to the current first lady and the second lady, as contained in the Professor Ntiamwa Beidou uh, Committee Report for Article 71, Office Holders. I think sometimes we ought to be... I want to season my words because when we put certain things out there, people take them hook, line, and sinker. Mm -hmm. First of all, if the former president says this, there was a time when former president Kufour had his own issues. He, in fact, started this entire thing based on that committee's report, the ex gratia and all of that in terms of what we are seeing, the trend, uh, where he made complaints. Was he whining then? The other presidents who did that, were they whining? And it is wrong, very wrong to put here, magnanimity. It is not the magnanimity. Oh, yeah. The president doesn't have an option. Oh, I'm going to do it because I feel like it. It is per the law. It is what, you know, we have in there, what we've decided to go by. It's not because President Akufuado wants to do it. That is not how it works. So this is misinformation, if you, if you, in a way, I mean. But finally, on the Intiamwa Beidou Committee report, mm -hmm. it wasn't, yes, members of the opposition NDC, I agree, uh, were also, fe they fed into it and said, why should we pay these sums to these people? It's not to say that when the first lady and the second lady, though that doesn't exist in our constitution, when they get out of office, at some point uh, they will, they will not get their packages. That is not what it says. This was a different issue. And it wasn't maybe the former president and the opposition doing this. It was ordinary Ghanaians who were concerned about how much was going to be paid. And these people, the first lady, Rebecca Kufuado, withdrew. So how do we now, you see, I read some stories sometimes in, but anyway, it is what it is. The Ghanaian Times, uh, Ghana bags $731.94 million in half year 2022 and speculation on Ghana's debt restructuring premature. If you have a story, you can come in with that before I do this final story on the IMF. Do the final story. Let's go to page 15 then. So let's do that. You know the IMF has been in town. Yeah. Stéphane Roudet. Mm -hmm. So uh, the International Monetary Fund has doused speculations that Ghana is poised to start talks on restructuring of its debt as part of plans to secure a $3 billion loan from the fund. According to the Bretton Woods Institution, the restructuring of Ghana's debt will be dependent on the outcome of its debt sustainability analysis, that is the DSA report. The IMF Director of Communications, Gary Rice, who disclosed this at a news conference in Washington, D.C., said the DSA reports would indicate whether there was the need for debt restructuring in the first place, and if necessary, how it should be carried out, as well as which areas would be affected. It's interesting because I've had conversations, the likes of Professor Buckman, mm -hmm. um, the, there's this one, I think, Sawyer, and others have shared their thoughts on this matter. The other day, I spoke to Dr. Cassiolato Forsen, mm -hmm. and a lot of them suggest we have to restructure our debt if we're going to keep our economy afloat. But now the IMF is seemingly throwing a spanner in the works that, hold on, it's not time yet. Yeah. Let's look at your debt sustainability. And from there, we'll determine whether you should even go down the road of and all of this, you know what, it, it creates a lot of distortion. A lot of investors, business people will not be in the most comfortable place because you don't know where the economy is headed in the next few weeks, mm -hmm. few months. Mm -hmm. Will we get the IMF program? What will this DSA reveal? It's a whole lot. It's a whole lot. A whole lot to digest. Talking about a whole lot, uh, Samuel Bordy parts with Hearts of Oak. Oh. Yeah. And The coach? Yeah, the coach. He's gone? Yeah. Since when? Since yesterday. And oh, wow. Nabila will tell us all about it up next in sports.
Good morning. Welcome to AM Sports here with me, Muftar Nabila Abdullah. The Black Stars of Ghana secured their second win under the leadership of Otto Ado as they defeated Nicaragua 1-0. Catch of Fatah Isako's only strike in the first half. Exactly. Aquí está Mensa, Gideon Mensa puso la pelota dentro del área, la bajaba Osman Bukari y corrigió bien Flete, si ganaba Marvin, Ariadner que la pelea, le quedó a Kudus, Mohamed que es peligrosísimo, Mohamed, Kudus mete dentro del área para Bukari, la barrida oportuna de Cristian Gutiérrez, Bukari que recentra el cabezazo de Barrera, el rebote Daniel Kofi quiere, Iñaki William que no puede, Kofi quiere, remata el arco, tapó la selección de Nicaragua, aquí está Lidura, zurda le vio Bull, Fatahu Isaku, el jugador del Sporting de Lisboa. Se desvió en Coronel, me da la impresión. Pudo haberla rozado ahí. Y no llegó Forbis. No llegó. Now let's hear from Otto Ado, who says that he is satisfied with the performance of the team in their game against Nicaragua, though he believes that the boys could have scored more goals. The output witnessed against Nicaragua uh, gives him lots of confidence heading to the FIFA World Cup. He also indicates that most of the players who joined the national team for this window's uh, international break will be making it to Qatar for the FIFA World Cup. I know from you. Are you content with this squad that you have, or you feel you still have to go searching for some more players? Do you see players who are not in the squad in camp at the moment join the squad going forward? Um, if that would be the case, I think our style of play, if we control the game, mostly we created a lot of chances. I just had a look at it, and um, we had like, the first half, we had good chances, the second half. Also nine, almost ten good chances, and uh, in all like six, seven very good chances. So we we'll think um, you have to criticize this, uh, yeah, the using of the chances. So we we'll have to score more. Um, this is clearly what we have to uh, where we have to improve. But uh, the rest was very good. We had a very good rest defense. Um, didn't allow any counters or any chances for the opponent. I think there was one corner. Um, so with the game as such, I'm satisfied, but surely we have to score more goals. Um, if that would be the case, I would, uh, I would, I would have thought them. Surely there are some few players who are injured. Um, we, we, like I said before, we will still monitor players, we will still monitor all the players who were at camp this, this time. Um, but um, I think the main players, and maybe all, uh, uh, will be will stay in that spot. Yeah, it's a uh, very, very good winger, powerful shots, and sometimes he needs just a little bit more patience with the shots and more preciseness instead of hammering all out. So, and this is what I told him. You, know, you should feel free, you should make his runs behind the line, you should go one against one, and then when he has the chance, you should use his uh, left foot very, very gently because if he uses gently, it's even enough just to be precise to, to score the goal and then you score. That's what I told them. And, yeah, I mean, they have some small injuries, but it's not too too much. I'm not too so happy. I think they will hopefully they will be able to, to train next week with the clubs. So we just wouldn't want to take that risk and um, it doesn't look too bad. I'm ready. Everybody's ready. Um, I think we qualified, that's why we deserve to be there and we will give everything. Um, Ghana has proven in the past that we are a team, um, we are a tournament team and surely I know that we have to improve but um, I'm looking forward to the tournament, can't wait and um, I, I know that we are ready.
My colleague, George Adegina, he was in France and Spain to watch the Black Stars play Brazil and Nicaragua. And he's been summing up what he makes of the performance of the senior national team as they prepare for the Mundial. So the Black Stars managed to beat Nicaragua by one goal to nail in the second pre-World Cup friendly as they prepare for the big tournament in Qatar in November. It would have been the expectation of many Ghanaians that the Black Stars would have scored many goals. Indeed, they created quite a number of chances. A chunk of them falling to Mohamed Kudus, but were just unfortunate to have scored the number of goals many were expecting. In the end, it was Fatou Sahaku in the first half who managed to latch onto a very good ball down his left foot and smash that into the net to record the only goal for, uh, for the Black Stars here and of course his first goal for the Black Stars officially. Well, Coach Otoado has got the rest of the time to decide what to do in terms of looking at the pool of players he has got and properly getting ready for the World Cup assignment. If the game against Brazil disappointed many, this one has not necessarily lifted the spirits but at least the fact that the team was creating chances and there was a lot in here in what was a good game against a very competitive Nicaragua side, you may just want to keep it this way. We'll see exactly what the Black Stars can do uh, from here as we keep a tabs on that. George Adi Jr. reporting from the Francesco Atez Carrasco Stadium inside Loca, Spain, where the Black Stars have just finished winning a friendly game by one goal to nil. After three matches in the new Ghana Premier League season, the first casualty in terms of a technical direction of a club happened on Tuesday, and that came at a, from the camp of Accra House of Oak as they parted company with head coach Samuel Buedu, head of the Supporters Union of Accra House of Oak. Jesse Heyman has been speaking to my colleague Nathaniel Arthur, and he says the decision of the board to sack Samuel Buedu has divided the supporters. It's, it's not been easy, and let me state that um, the supporters at this moment are divided if you follow most of our social media platforms. Uh, some are of the view that the management or the board took the right decision in allowing the coach to go. Others are of the view that the coach should have remained or should have been given extra, extra more matches to play. So at the moment, the supporters are divided, uh, but... Uh, like I stated earlier, it's an emotional moment because Coach Samuel Buidu, you know, made a difference after 10 years or after a decade, you know, since the, the current uh, majority shareholder, Toby Afede, took over. He was the only coach that, that, that the supporters, you know, uh, started following because uh, under, under, under Coach Buidu, we started winning trophies and it was something that we were lacking for so many years. In July, it was Kumasi Asante Kotoko who were making headlines after their decision to also part company with uh, former coach Prosper Nathan Ogum. In September, it is the turn of Accra House of Oak. And Kotoko's decision to hire uh, Sedu Zebo as a new man to lead the technical affairs of the club has not been the best of decisions, yes, as they were knocked out of the CAF Champions League and also yet to pick a win in the Ghana of Premier League. Uh, however, a board member of the club, your board in Genfi, uh, met the players and the technical team, assuring them of the support of every member of the board as they seek to defend the Premier League title. We just come in to give you assurance and our support that uh, we are with you through the second thing. We have lost, it is football. Can you go, we've had that experience before. I was at the stadium in 1979. We beat them 1-0 over there. They came here, they beat us 1-0, and we lost on penalties. It is the same thing that has happened. Mm -hmm. And that time, we had great players like Razak and uh, Pukwe Free and all of them. Name that, you know, carry weight, Kukudazi and all of them. We lost. So it is football. We have lost. Don't worry too much about it. I'm here just to give you the motivation that you deserve. I want you to know that you are not alone. We are with you as a board. We haven't forgotten about you. We are with you. We think that you have lost anything. We haven't. Great teams like Brazil, they lost something like Liverpool, Real Madrid, they all lose. So it's football. So just consider it, okay, we have lost. 
what is the way forward? Forget about whatever has happened. Mm. And I'm telling you, victory will come to you. Mm. And we, the board, we are with you. The technical team, we are with you. Okay? So, we are the Welcome back on the AM show. We get into our first big story, and it's all about energy, oil, or in this case, gas. So Parliament's Mines and Energy Committee is asking questions about a GNPC deal with Genza Energy. GNPC has a gas supply deal with a company called Genza Energy and has been criticized by some minority uh, groups or the minority in Parliament, as well as civil society groups, Imani Africa, Africa Center for Energy Policy, as one which will cause financial loss to the state. According to them, Ghana buys gas for $95.8 million and sells it on to Genza for $43.5 million, leading to a net loss, uh, if you strike the average, of 52 million American dollars. Now, no one does business to lose. So why is this happening, if it is indeed happening? We delve into these matters with our guests. Ben Boache is the executive director of ASAP. There's also Kojopoku, who is an energy analyst, and John Jinapo, former deputy power minister. He joins the conversation as well. Gentlemen, a very good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. All right, so I'm going to have to determine uh, who are those responding? Whom do I have, please? <laughs> I guess you on the screen. Do, do, do I have Mr. Janapo? Yes, 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 you have. Great. Yes, you have uh, Ben Boache as well. Okay, so I have John Janapo, I have Ben Boache. Uh, let, let's, start, let's start from the standpoint of civil society and the red flags you've been raising. So you're saying basically that this deal is inimical to the fortunes of the state because, like I pointed out, uh, even state institutions would want to at least break even, not incur losses. Break down what is happening to us between the GNPC, Genza Energy, and why Ghana Gas as a whole should come into the fray. Um, thanks, Ben. I think, uh, first of all, I mean, what we have been trying to do is to stay on an agreement that we have seen. Okay. I understand that there could be some tough war that we don't have the full facts on. Mm. But we have seen an agreement that has been established uh, between Ghana, uh, uh, you know, National Oil Company, uh, GNPC, and uh, Jensa, which is a private uh, company. And in that agreement, right. uh, GNPC is selling gas uh, for $2.79 per MMBTU uh, to Jensa for the infrastructure that they have constructed uh, from Pristia to Daman and Takwa, and also an extension uh, to um, some bauxite mines in the Ashanti region. So the fundamental question that we raised um, is why that discount? Because the market price for gas is, was about $6.08 uh, at the time. So why that huge discount? I mean, government can give discount to some productive sectors uh, to prop them up, but it has to be clearly established what the country stands to gain uh, from that massive uh, discount. But we did not see, you know, the, the, the benefit for this kind of transaction because Jensa essentially is a power company. So what they are doing is using uh, the gas that they get from uh, GMPC uh, to generate electricity and sell to uh, the mines. And we do know that in the gas market price, uh, transmission is part of uh, the, the, the cost. So if you are a transporter, you are, you, you're paid for transporting the gas. 
we do not subsidize the gas for the transmission of you know the, the gas. So it has, it's an add-on to the actual cost uh, of the gas. And that is why we are struggling to see how the commodity, the, the, the cost of the gas itself, is being subsidized for Gensa uh, to use for the mines, instead of Gensa adding on the transmission cost uh, to its customers, who are the, the mines, really. Because uh, if VR regenerates electricity, it sells to all of us, you know, with the transmission charge embedded in, in it. So why does a mine you know, gets such a huge discount uh, because there is an infrastructure that benefits them. Uh, uh, you know, so these are the questions that we are raising. And it is a simple arithmetic. If you calculate the discount uh, that we are giving on the gas against, you know, what, uh, you know, Gensa is actually paying or the true market uh, price, what we are giving to Gensa is about $1.5 billion dollars. And that is easy to calculate, all right? GMPC itself, in its tariff proposal to uh, PURC, indicated that the true market price for everybody else because of this transaction should be about 7.9 per MMBTU. Today, PURC has approved a new tariff at 5.9, which creates about $2 gap in the market without knowing who is going to pay that difference for us to achieve that true market price that GMPC talks about. So if you compute that, the $2 uh, gap between the 5.9 approved and the 7.9, what GMPC itself says, should be the true market price, that creates you know, about even $3.6 billion within the 16-year period, unless PRC agrees to charge all the other power producers the extra uh, $2. Then the fundamental question is, how do we pay for that if you know, that $2 is not passed through uh, to the other consumers? And if they pass that through, what would be the implication for all other consumers uh, of power? Because it means that you and I will have to pay more you know, to be able to subsidize uh, for Gensa, you know, who is making money by selling uh, uh, to the mines. So these are legitimate. In, in, in other words, uh, this is a loss to the state, a loss that will trickle down to the ordinary Ghanaian because, through, through taxes. That's what you're saying. Exactly. Let me break that, that even home, right? Um, Ghana Gas and um, you know, GMPC sells the gas to the market, and they are supposed to recover the value of the gas, at least at the barest minimum, how much it takes to produce the gas. They're supposed to recover that, you know, so that the state doesn't intervene. But the reality is that the state has been paying for gas because we cannot recover uh, the full cost of the gas. Two weeks ago, ENI drew down on Ghana's letters of credit with Standard Chartered Bank to the tune of $180 million because GMPC couldn't pay for the gas. In total, the outstanding LCU drawdown is about $360 million dollars which we have to pay, which will be calculated and accounted for in the new negotiation uh, with the IMF, all right? And it is clear that this month and the last month's bill will still be paid by the state. And this is because GMPC is selling the gas at a discount to France, all right? And they are not able to recover the true cost. We are not sanitizing the space to allow the full cost of the gas to be recovered so that taxes don't go to pay for it. You know, so now the state has to find money instead of building schools, instead of building hospitals, instead of, you know, financing social development to go and pay for discounts that have been granted by GMPC. So interesting points you make. Uh, let me just avert your mind to this right before I bring in John Janapo. I just want clarity from you on this. Uh, yesterday, of course, there was that engagement, uh, parliament and the GMPC's leadership and Dr. Amin Adam, the Deputy uh, Energy Minister, made the point that you, that is Imani Africa and ASEP, do not have the full facts. And instead of seeking the full facts from the GMPC, you have gone ahead to put this out there to, to throw dust, seemingly, in the eyes of the public. Why 
have you not gone to the GMPC for the full details of what uh, is happening? Or are you apprised already of all of that? No, I think we can, we can appreciate what the minister wants or what the government official wants from civil society. But the reality is that when it comes to advocacy strategy, we don't take it from politicians. Uh, we decide what strategy works uh, for us. Unless the minister is saying that the agreement that has been signed is not credible. I mean, this is data that any student can peruse and understand. If we take that document, and believe that what they have signed is the truth, then we can do analysis based on that without even asking GMP to come and give us further explanation. And even to look at what they did to Parliament yesterday, it tells you that if we had gone to GMPC for explanation, we're just simply wasting our time. Because how, you have how, so? how so? Before Parliament, you have GMPC coming before Parliament, and they present data. That is completely different from what they have signed in the agreement, all right? In the agreement, GMPC says, we are giving you a discount on the gas, and it is written in black and white English, right? And then they go to parliament to say that it is not a discount on the gas, but we are rather applying industrial development tariff, you know, and then came up with a different calculation to achieve the discount uh, that they gave uh, to, to, to Jensa. Even assuming that you're applying uh, the industrial development tariff, why do you further discount that? Even if the industrial development tariff is 4.2, why do you discount that again uh, further to uh, $1.7 uh, per uh, MMBTU? So it clearly tells you that they're just trying to explain away with English and get away with this kind of uh, uh, financial crime that is being committed against the state. So, so just clarify for me, you think something is being hidden? No, but I mean, it's clear. If, if even before Parliament, they couldn't speak to the agreement, you know, that they have signed. Um, it clearly tells you that they are not willing to um, give you the, full, uh, the, the real intent uh, uh, of what they are doing. But we right. also have to pay attention to the, the actual fact okay. that if you are creating that subsidy, how does the budget absorb that? Okay. Well, uh, all right. And that conversation is you know, very important. We'll, we'll come we to that. We'll that come to that all important point. Just hold for me, uh, Mr. Boache. Let me bring in John Janapo on, on this matter. Just, just stay on that. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. But Mr. Janapo, so you've heard from Deputy Energy Minister, Dr. Amin Adam, who says, look, uh, you're merely looking for something where there's actually nothing. You should have just gone to the GNPC. Mr. Boache says, it would have been a futile attempt to go to the GNPC, uh, looking at the fact that what figures there are in terms of the contract, the deal, and what they are putting forth are not uh, commensurable. How do you feel about this entire development? Is there a rat somewhere? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. First of all, let me comment, except, let me comment Imani for bringing this issue to the fore. That is how you work with civil society. And what parliaments do is that when such issues come up, our duty is to take it up, investigate it, deal with the matter conclusively. And so it will be very, very wrong to accuse the money or ASAP of any wrongdoing. Indeed, today we are all discussing this issue because these two civil society organizations decided to bring the issues to the fore. And that is exactly what we sought or seeking to do as a parliamentary committee. And so yesterday, indeed, we met GMPC. A lot of issues came up. They couldn't answer some of the issues I raised with them. And so they are supposed to go back, finish us with further and better particulars, and appear before us. But let me just give you a quick genesis of all this issue. And these are the issues we are looking at. Is there value for money? Did they go through the right processes? Is the state benefiting? And all the issues except also raised. Don't forget that Ghana Gas and Jensa had an initial agreement. I think the agreement was signed on the 24th of 20th April 2018. At that time, the WACO, which is the weighted average cost of gas, was about 7.9. 
Then for some very strange reason, Ghana Gas receives instructions from the minister then, Mr. Pichano, to reduce the tariff to 6.5. That for us is a key issue we want to investigate. And that's what Ben raised. Why would you classify that company as an industrial company and apply the industrial tariff? That for me is very, very important. Why are you not doing the same for GM, uh, VRA, for Ameri, and for the other plants? Why this particular plant? Ghana Gas also decided that Jensa, which wanted to do a 12-inch pipeline, should rather expand it to a 20-inch pipeline. Why would Ghana Gas make that decision? Today, as a stands, we are paying capacity charges for that pipeline. Jensa is a private entity. And so usually my focus is on Ghana Gas, GMPC, and government. Why extend that pipeline from 12 to 20? When you know very well that you don't have that gas to flow through that pipeline. And so that is very, very important for me. And in the Ghana Gas agreement, but, Ghana hmm. Gas was supposed to pay $3.6 million per month. For 96 months, if they wanted to own that 135-kilometer pipeline, that brings it to $345 million. That's quite a colossal amount. And so I'm asking myself, what investment appraisal analysis did they do? Was there value for money? And so clearly, GMPC couldn't answer some of these questions. And so Ghana Gas would have to appear before Parliament so that we can deal with this issue. So that's the aspect of Ghana Gas. Now let me deal with GMPC. Uh, before, before you get into the GMPC, so... Those two crucial matters you raise, the classification of the company as an industrial company, and then the bit about why the extension of the pipeline came to be from 12 kilometers to 20 kilometers. Two questions on From 12 each. inches to 20 inches. 12 inches to 20 That's inches, fine. So 12 inches to 20 inches. That's a, an addition of eight inches. So just to clarify, is it impossible in this instance, for Genza to be classified as an industrial company or entity, did, what exactly is the error there? Is it totally out of scope for them to be classified as such? That is why we are, well, that, that's what we are, that's what we are investigating. What went into that decision? And like Ben said, don't also forget that VRA is a state-owned entity. So if you sell the gas at 7.9 to VRA, why would you sell it? 6.5 to another entity. Uh, we need all these answers as a parliamentary select committee. And that's why we are bringing these entities before us to provide the justification. I'm, I'm not even dealing with the cost of the pipeline and all. I'm just saying that why that disparity is something that I think that we ought to go into and determine that. Having established that. Uh, uh, I, I just want us to go step by step. I, I know you... No. Your horse is rearing to go on some, I'm ready for you. some, some of the matters. But so if, if, if you were not sure, certain, uh, on, on the bit about its classification, the classification of the company, because the information out there is categorical. You, you just said it, that you've questioned them on why the company was categorized as such and that the answers given you by the GMPC were not satisfactory. Does that mean you still think the categorization was wrong? Um, That's why we need. Ben, can I help them? Could you, could you please hold. Just hold. Just hold, hold for me. Please. I'll come to you, please. Just no, hold I for me. I just want to answer that question for him. No, I, I want him to give me because they have come out with with an idea. I want him to state the basis on which they came up. So, uh, yeah, Ms, but I'm Mr. Janapo, the answer to that. I want to give you the answer to that. Th there's a reason I want Mr. Janapo to answer. I'll come to you, Kojo. Mr. Janapo. Yes. Yeah, so, government would have to come and answer that. Because we're a fact-finding committee, PRC would have to come and answer that. And uh, like I said, the agreement was between Ghana Gas and Jensa. So GMPC said they couldn't answer that. And you see, we are an independent fact-finding committee. And so we have to put this question you are putting before us to all these entities and organizations. And like I told you, GMPC was a label to answer why they decided to classify them as an industrial customer, because it was an agreement between Ghana Gas and Jensa. So we've summoned Ghana Gas. Ghana Gas will appear before us on Monday 
and we would uh, probe that further as a committee. Next point. So you, you question why it's been increased from 12 inches to 20 inches, uh, an increment of 8 inches, which will come with uh, cost. Again, are you, are you intimating then that by this there was something cooked, something untaught? In other words, is it going to be a waste to the state, the additional inches of the pipeline? Is it going to be a waste? So as a stance, Jensa wants to do a 12-inch pipeline. If you request them to do a 20-inch pipeline, mm -hmm. you are asking them to go raise additional finance. And so whether you utilize that additional capacity or not, you ought to pay for that. Currently, we are not utilizing that additional capacity, and we are paying for that. So that amounts to what you call excess capacity payments, if you were to put it in very simple terms. But they have gone ahead to raise financing to construct a 20-inch pipeline instead of a 12-inch pipeline. You are not flowing the required volumes of gas through the 20-inch pipeline in order to utilize it. But they have to pay their financiers. And so we are paying for it. And when we asked GMPC, they came up with some ideas about an integrated box site that they had envisaged and all that. And so clearly... We ought to establish, why would you do that? Moreover, do you even have the volume of gas to flow through that pipeline? And I ask, what is the maximum all the fuels can produce? If I account for all the maximum all the fuels can produce, I'm clear in my mind that we cannot fully utilize that pipeline today. Uh, Mr. Janapo, just hold for me. Let me bring in Kojo Poku. Kojo, you can, you can uh, share your thoughts on, on that now. Because the, the accusations have been made, I wanted Mr. Janapo to at least share what his specific thinking was on that. Uh, Kojo, over well, to you. Let me look. Jensa is an IPP. So that is why everybody is saying that if you are doing that for Jensa, you should do that for other companies. Jensa is an independent power producing company. They produce power and sell to the mining companies. They are like Ameri, they are like Car Power, they are like, um, what do you call it, Car Power and uh, Asogli. The difference between Asogli, Car Power, and Jensa is that Jensa builds these power plants for the mines. They generate the power using gas and sell it to the mining companies. So you cannot classify them as an industrial company when they are an IPP, because the license they have from Energy Commission is an IPP company. So that is the clarification I wanted to give. Uh, that is why you can't classify them as an industrial company. They are an IPP. So per the contractual ag agreement then, if they are classified as an industrial company, automatically there's a problem. It's wrong. You can't do that. It's wrong. H how did we end up yeah, here then? The how did we end up here then the with, this, with this classification? Not, okay, so let me, let me explain. Let me explain further, okay? So let's understand what Jensa is. Jensa is a company that has been operating as far back as 2012. They have plants in the mines that they put in there, and they've been using LPG and other sources to generate gas for uh, to generate power for the LH for the mining companies during the Doomsaw era. Okay. Now along the line, when Ghana Gas built the pipeline from um, the Abuazi to Pristia, it means that gas was now available closer to where their customers were or where their customers are. So when the gas got to Pristia, um, Jensa now went into a contractual agreement with Ghana Gas to obtain the power from Pristia and extend it to their customers. But this is where it gets a bit uh, tricky. There was a letter from Energy Commission in 2019 now, at all points, Jensa have seek to get discount because they are saying that, look, we are building the transmission lines to our customers. And because we are building the transmission lines to our customers, you should give us a bit of a discount or we are going to use more gas than any other person. It's a business. It's a private man. He always wants the best for his customers. So he asks them for a discount. It's not a problem. They wrote to Energy Commission in 2019. And Energy Commission told um, Ghana Gas that they cannot give a discount to um, Jensa because um, everybody has to buy on the weighted average because it's a regulated market. GMPC, who owns the gas, takes the gas at the take or pay from ENI. 
So you cannot deregulate it and let everybody go about and sell it the way they want it. So there is a letter which from Energy Commission explains that you cannot give the gas out discounted. But they now put a caveat and said, that, look, even if you want to give a discount, that discount has to be a refund for the investment that they are making. So this is what it means. If Jensa is prepared to build a pipeline and you want to give them a discount for the investment, then that discount you are giving them for the investment should be a refund for the investment, which means in the long term, that pipeline will have to be owned by the state because the state would have refunded them for the investment. Now, something very curious in GMPC's presentation to Parliament yesterday, they keep mentioning we reserve capacity. My point to GMPC is very simple. Jensa only built pipeline to their customers. Now, why are you reserving capacity on that pipeline? What benefit is it to you? Now, if you follow the Energy Commission um, advice, if you give him the discount, in the long run, you will own that pipeline. So why are you reserving capacity? And in some cases, they say that they are reserving capacity for 25 years at an extra nine years. Who is making that decision? A pipeline that we can own. We are letting the person own it, give him a discount, and say that we are reserving capacity. The guy is only building pipeline to his customers. So why are you reserving capacity on that pipeline? Does that mean does that mean that stance technically does not make sense? That approach. It does not. No, it does not make sense. And for me, I'm very sad that the parliamentarians did not call and um, ask to the meeting because I think as civil society, I mean, ASAP and Imani raised the issue. And when they were calling um, um, GMPC, they should have called the civil society for us to come. Because we have sat down and done the analysis. Ben has spent a lot of time on this matter. We've all sat and looked at the data. And let not anybody, and I'm very surprised the minister um, is defending this thing. GMPC has come out to say that they are not government. GMPC is an entity on its own. They have a board. They have a board chairman. Why is the minister defending them? Before ASAP comes up with anything, before Imani comes up with anything, the likes of us, the likes of Dr. Manteo, the fact of a lot of people look at this data, and we are convinced that there's something wrong going on. The state is being cheated. And somebody will come out and say, oh, uh, somebody has got it wrong. They have got it wrong. It's interesting, isn't it? Uh, because you are intimating the state is being cheated, and the state is retorting that, look, you're, you don't have your facts right. We'll, we'll get into that. I'll... I'll, I'll, I'll go back to Benjamin Bwache shortly, but, but stay with me, Kojopoku. So we've heard from the chairman of the committee. We've, we've, we've heard from the chairman, okay, Samuel Atachia. He says, you as a group of CEOs, after conducting your research, you should have gone to the GNPC. Uh, you, you did not do that. Why? Okay, so let me explain. When you are doing analysis, you need information from both sides. Most of these information are public knowledge. As Ben reiterated, the agreement that they have signed, which is the subject of the analysis, is a public document. Okay? So if there is an agreement between two entities, I look at the civil society space, we look at these documents, look at the letter from GMPC, sorry, from Energy Commission. We look at letter from even EMT, Economic Management Team, directing that somebody should be made to sell power to only the power supplies and somebody should be made to do this. We look at all of this and ask ourselves, the supreme concern is, is Ghana getting value for money? Is Ghana being cheated? And as per the agreement, if me and you, we use electricity, we are paying more for power, the gas that we use, we are paying at 6.08. But a private company who makes money as a private individual and makes profit into his pocket is getting that gas cheaper. And the reason somebody is doing that is because they are reserving capacity on a pipeline. Meanwhile, that pipeline he is building, we have not cited any law that allows a private company to own pipelines. So I think G um, Ghana Gas is the only company that we know are allowed, and I stand to be corrected. I think Ghana Gas is the only company that we know is allowed by law to basically build these pipelines. So if they want to make the investment, then it should be a boot, build, operate, and transfer. After they have recovered um, their investment through the discount you are giving them. So if we do this right, 
all the pipelines that these guys, Gensa, is building, in the long run, after they recovered the investment through the discount, should now be owned by the state, and they should pay us for transmitting those, through those pipelines, not the reverse. Uh, Mr. Boache, what else do you find dodgy about this entire contract? Be because it appears as we peel it like an onion, layer by layer, there seem to be many problems. The categorization of the company as an industrial one, uh, the, the, the pipeline that must be constructed and the size of it, the extension of it, and excess power and all of that. But what else do you find problematic uh, you know, about this entire contract? No, I think the whole arrangement doesn't sit well uh, with us, and um, and that's where we're raising the concerns. I mean, I heard Honorable Yanapo uh, uh, say that uh, the approval of 6.5 was wrong in the first place. And if you check the letter that was written by the Energy Commission, it was really to correct that. It means that it was wrong, and the Commission sought to correct that wrong. So they responded to Ghana Gas to say that you cannot give them industrial tariff because they are power users. What you can do is to give them a rebate on the transmission charge so that that pays for the investment and then you can own it. So subsequently, Ghana Gas, I'm told, and I've seen some documents also from uh, floating, that they also signed an agreement with Jensa to refer to the WACOG or the weighted average cost of gas approved by PURC as a reference price for their engagement with Jensa. So what that means is that Ghana Gas was now beginning to respond to the regulatory uh, agencies and to price the gas at that level. All right. So I think that's where GMPC was not, uh, Jensa was not happy. And then they went to GMPC, got ministerial approval, uh, approvals, got EMT uh, declaration that um, uh, Ghana Gas cannot sell to power uh, producers, you know, so that that allows GMPC to then negotiate with Jensa on this agreement that has become the subject of this uh, uh, conversation. But check it. If EMT, you know, bars Ghana gas from selling to power consumers, except industrial consumers, so what that means is that Ghana gas is supposed to sell to industrial consumers and uh, GMPC is supposed to sell uh, to power consumers. How then does GMPC now get into an agreement that says that it is selling gas to Gensa uh, for an industrial tariff. You know, so the explanations that are coming, and that's why I'm surprised that you know those explanations were given to Parliament. And uh, Mr. Atacha says he's happy uh, with GMPC and not with civil society uh, for raising questions on numbers that are in the document. <laughs> All right. So those are the fundamental questions, and I expect that Parliament we we'll perhaps pay more attention to the numbers that we have put out. We would have been happy to hear um, uh, Honorable Atasha and uh, Honorable Katie Hammond speak to the numbers and say that there is no subsidy and also compute, you know, the 3.26 that has been given on the uh, uh, existing infrastructure and a further discount to uh, 4.3 uh, uh, on the extension to uh, Kumasi and say that those numbers do not discount the price by 1.5 billion dollars that way they will be you know telling the truth to the Ghanaian public but just to simply say that we are being sensational and without speaking to the numbers you're not being fair to the conversation that we are having at this point uh, uh for, for the national interest and i think we have to stay with the numbers mm. let gmps to justify why we should go and buy gas on the average 6.08 and they want to sell it at 7.29 that gap has to be accounted for and that is all we are asking for right we have to put the numbers together and justify why that decision and why Jensad merits that kind of subsidy which the Ghanaian public is going to pay right it's not for free let, let me bring in John Jinapur uh, even before we talk about the hundred million dollar loss that we stand to incur per year Let's look at the pricing and why you feel it was wrong in the first place for them to be getting the units of gas for $6.50 and not something upwards. The contract would suggest that they had the option, in fact, they had made a commitment to pay between $6.50 and $7.29. Of course, any rational organization would opt for that which is on the lower end of the spectrum. This was according to the WACOG. 
what exactly is problematic about it if they, they had this range and the minister suggested that they go for the least range? Yeah, so the first thing is that does the minister have that power to decide that a regulated market, which is regulated by the PURC, they should rather charge an industrial tax? And that is where I fault government. I thought that this should be an issue for PURC. And so this is a key issue that we are dealing with. And we will also be inviting PURC. Let me assure ASAP that I made a, 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 a case to the chairman, and the chairman determines how the meeting goes, that we should invite ASAP, we should invite Imani, and also listen to them. Because we want to get to the bottom of this matter. And like I said, it will be wrong for the minister. And if you look at the letter, the minister, uh, the letter from Ghana Gas dated 21st August 2019, the then minister, Mr. Peter Mewu, unilaterally decides that they should be granted an industrial tariff. But that is not even the key issue. I was, I was building a point so that we appreciate what happens. Now, the EMT under Dr. Mahmoud Balbia, for very strange reasons, decides that Ghana Gas should no longer sell power to the power producers. That, that for me is very, very strange. Don't forget, they were paying 6.5. When the EMT decides that Ghana Gas should no longer sell and that GNPC should now sell, this existing 6.5 was terminated. And then GNPC then goes to sign a new agreement on the same pipeline for 4.2. That is a, that's a major issue that, as, as, as a ranking member, I want to delve into. Why would a 6.5 change to 4.2? GMPC made a preposition. That is because the workup changed from 7.9 to 6.08. If you do the rate of reduction from 7.9 to 6.08, and the rate of reduction from 6.5 to 4.2, for me, I have serious questions and serious problems with that. Is, is, it, so, is it more? Is it more the reduction that was given then? It's less. It's more. The reduction is more comparative to the work of reduction. So, so you agree at least that, rationally speaking, based on the reduction on the other end, there should have been a, a reduction for Genza. It's just that the reduction was too much in terms of how much they'd be paying that, that, per, that, that per unit. That is something that is what we want to go in. And like all of us have said, why would you sell the gas to the other power plants at 6.08, but sell to only one entity for 4.2? Why would you do that? What, what, what informs that? Then GNPC also decides that the pipeline to Kumasi should now be 24 inches. Already this 20 inch pipeline, which was moved from 12 to 20, you are not utilizing it despite all the mines that are within that engine. Now you are supplying power to only Ameri for now, and you are asking them to increase it to 24 inch. But there's even a major issue there. If I may just share this with you, I don't know if that was possible. I would have just shared the current, um, let me open, the current PURC tariff approval. If you look at the weighted average cost of gas, the PURC approved tariff is 4.4499. That is the commodity price, the commodity. When you are determining the gas of price, there are three main items, the commodity, the processing, and the transportation. So if the commodity is 4.449, and you go to sell it at 2.79 or even 2.9, what it means is that you cannot pay the, the 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 producers of gas at the fields. I, I don't know if you get my point. I do. Minimum, you must sell minimum break even, so that the gas that you are off taking from our fields, you are able to pay for that gas. Surprisingly, GNPC told us no. It will be five point nine. I perused all the documents. We couldn't find a five point nine. So I asked that yes, assuming it's five point nine. I want a full breakdown of the 5.9. What is the commodity? What is the everything? So that I would classify them into commodity, 
processing and transmission and know which goes where. That could not be provided yesterday. So the chairman is directed. The GMPC goes back and recalculates the components of that so-called 5.9 and make it available to the committee. And so I share... So, so the calculation of the 5.9 was an afterthought, after you brought it up? After I brought the issue of the work up, because with a weighted average cost of gas, you cannot go below the lowest. You must at a, at, a, at, a, at a minimum charge the average price so that at least you break even. But when you are charging below even the minimum, then you are making the loss, which means the state must step in in order to fill that void. So I raised serious issues even with the whole computation they brought with even the 4.2. And they said, no, it should have rather been 5.9. I said, give me the breakdown of the 5 for now, do the analysis. That has not been answered. And so we still have a lot to investigate, a lot to deal with, in order to ensure that we get to the bottom of this matter. Mm. Because there was a persistent or existing contract between Ghana Gas and Jensen. Why would the economic management team decide that they want to vary that by taking a decision? that Ghana gas can no longer sell to Jensen. And why is it that just after they took that decision, that contract was suspended, GMPC moves in, and we see a reduction to 4.2. And of that, GMPC gets only 2.7. The question is that the 2.7 that GMPC gets, is it enough to pay the Jubilee, Tain, and the Sankofa partners? If that is not enough, like we are demonstrating, then there's a shortfall. So these are very serious issues mm. that are being raised. And I really commend ASAP and Imani and all those people who are raising those issues. We are not targeting any company. I have no interest in targeting any company. I've had so many comments. All I want to do is to get to the bottom of this matter so that we bring all the facts out. And if there are suggestions, if there are recommendations, would make say. And so let nobody try to target any civil society, any individual, and put it as if they are on a vendetta. No, 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 no. We are doing a legitimate job. We are doing a service to the nation. And we intend to pursue that to its logical conclusion. Let me bring in Kojo Poku. Uh, when you look at the figures, the, the, the facts, the numbers, at least if we are to stick to them, uh, how workable are they? You just heard John Dinapo make mention of the fact that, look, you cannot have a commodity price pegged at 4.49 and sell at 2.9. That will be a net loss of about $2 or so per unit. What it then means is that you cannot pay your power producers and it's going to incur debt, debt which will roll over to the ordinary Ghanaian. The GMPC now says that the actual figure is 5.9. What are we missing, Kojo? Do we have Kojo Poku with us? Um, can you hear me? I can hear you now. Please go ahead. Okay, yes. Uh, aside that, let me put this out there. Aside that, Jensa are um, going to negotiate the molecules, the gas directly with GMPC. They were to pay the transmission of the gas to Ghana Gas. Now, for some mysterious reasons, they don't even pay Ghana Gas. As I speak... Now, my checks at Ghana Gas says that they owe Ghana Gas... Let's look at it this way earlier. They sell power directly to the mine. So these mines do not take power from the national grid. Kojo, we're struggling a bit with your connection, Kojo. So um, uh, we'll try to work it out. I'll have you make that point again, start afresh, because we lost chunks of what you were saying. But I'll put that same question to Benjamin Boache. Uh, 
how do we fill in the gaps? And, and do you take the 5.9 that the GMPC, its revised figure, is that more, is that more logical? Looking at the arrangements with Jensa, quick one so we can bring in Kojo back. Yeah, so the 5.9 uh, figure is the PRC regulated tariff mm -hmm. uh, for uh, you know the market. Uh, GMPC itself says that that price should actually be 7.9 to be able to account for their arrangement and contract with um, Jensa. So what that means, as I indicated, is that there is a two dollar gap which has to be accounted for. And by all indications, it shows that PRC is not considering GMP's arrangement with uh, Gensa in calculating its price for the market. So if the market pays 5.9 today, and the actual price should be 7.9, according to GMPC, then there is a $2 gap, which would you know, create that uh, uh, 3.6 billion in 16 years, as we indicated. So we really need to find out how we pay for that. And I think GMPC really, at this point, doesn't care whether they are able to pay for the gas or not, because finance ministry will pay. All right? When they go to attack the LCs, the Ministry of Finance will have to find money to go and pay. So they are happy to discount for some people, and they are happy to do whatever they have to do uh, as an entity. But we need to interrogate that and ensure that we can bring sanity uh, to... Uh, the market okay. and the arbitrariness, uh, arbitrariness mm. in the sector has to be checked. All right. You know, so what it means is that if I want gas today and I can go and see the minister, the minister can just by a stroke of a pen decide that he's selling the gas to me at 1.7. Whether it costs Ghana money or not, it is not the matter to consider. All right. These are problems that perhaps parliament now has to take the decision to be part of that conversation so that the public press doesn't continue to bleed the way it is. All right, Benjamin, watch it. Oh. isolated decisions, and it mm. comes back to hurt everybody. All right, hold for me. Let me bring in Kojo Poku, who now joins us via the phone lines. Kojo, uh, you were making a point. Start from the top. A, a show on communication in this country. Energy suffers too much. Communication is a key. We can't even do our show properly with all these networks not working well. Let, let me now go back into the point I was making, Ben. Um, okay, so what I was saying is this. We all remember about capacity charges. We say that, look, we've procured power that if it's a take or pay, if we don't have money, um, we don't use this uh, power, we have to pay the IPPs for these capacity charges. And you look at Gensa producing power to the mine. Now, Gensa is giving gas cheaper, uh, sorry, is giving gas cheaper. Government is having to subsidize that shortfall from all the calculations that my John and Ben have put out there. Okay, so now on that leg, government is losing money on that side. Then go to the capacity charge. This mine, if it wasn't for Gensa, would be consuming power on the national grid. So the power that we are not using, which is a capacity charge, where we are paying the take or pay because it's contract we've signed and we are not fully utilizing all the power, we are now also paying take or pay because nobody's using the power. If it wasn't for Gensa producing cheaply for these mining companies, the mining companies would be on a national grid to also consume the power that otherwise we are paying take or pay for. So on both ends of the spectrum, the government is losing money as a, as a result of this deal. And what everybody should look at this conversation is a group of people being Ghanaian. Anytime that civil society have come out to say some of these things, we've been called all sorts of names. At a point, we've been called anti Ghana. When we are the ones trying to save Ghana money, and people are defending a deal that makes Ghana lose its money. So if somebody is coming out to say that, look, you signed a deal, which is costing you about $1.5 billion, everybody should be worried because we recently collected $750 million from, um, from a loan, which came in and everybody was happy. But you have one single transaction from GMPC costing the country $1.5 billion on one leg. Don't talk of the capacity charges that we are paying as a result of those mining companies not taking power from the national grid. So that is the problem. I don't see how anybody is not interested in conversations that save Ghana money. In all thoughts, and I want us to incorporate some aspects of the discussion we've already had. Benjamin Wachi just made mention of the fact that the arbitrariness in the sector must be checked because guess what? 
any minister who comes uh, may, you know, exercising his discretion with the stroke of a pen, sign this off like uh, we've seen in this instance, uh, pending justification or pending whether uh, this was right or wrong. And that could be inimical to the economic fortunes of the state. But that minister would have done that. One, how do we resolve that? And two, what role should the PURC be playing in all of this? Or is it too late for the PURC to intervene? Quick answers to these two questions, each of you, one minute, and it's a wrap. I'll start with you, uh, Kojo. Well, please, the institutions should work. Look, we clearly saw and we've clearly seen that uh, the institutions can work if they are allowed to work. We've seen the letter from Energy Commission. Energy Commission rightfully told Ghana Gas what the law is and what the policy is. If the institution works, then everybody doesn't need to go to the politicians to intervene. And the politicians should stay away when the institutions are working. So PULC does what they are supposed to do. Energy, Energy Commission gives clarity and also do these policies and enforces them. So when there was a transaction between Ghana Gas and Gensa, the institution was working. Energy Commission was able to give clarity. And if everybody had stayed on the fringes and let the institutions work, we wouldn't be where we are today. But the minute Gensa found their way to GMPC, GMPC now managed to get the minister and the EMT involved. And for me, it's very strange. Why is the EMT getting involved in this? I, it, 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 it's, it's a situation where the economic management team is supposed to look at policies that make us money. These are a situation where the economic management team is making policies that's making us lose money. So that, for me, is strange. So the bottom line is the institution should be allowed to work. Ministers and all politicians should stay away and let the technocrats do their work. Kojo, we're grateful that you've, uh, you, you joined us for this conversation. Kojo Poko is an energy analyst. Uh, let me bring in John Janapo, former deputy power minister. Your take? Hello, Mr. Janapo. Yes, yes. First of all, it, it does appear that the EMT is overstretching its bound. If you remember the famous PDS scandal, mm. it's the same vice president who decided to vary and waive some of the conditions president. Today, the same vice president is getting involved in this deal and shortchanging Ghana guys. And so I think that I cannot agree more with Ben Wache. And uh, Kojo, uh, the PURC what, what, is what, the... I, I'm curious, though. I'm curious. I, I beg your pardon. What, why, why point to the vice president specifically? He's the head of the economic management team. Right. So if I'm talking of a ministry, I'll be talking of the head of the ministry. And that's why I took on Mr. Peter Meu for instructing Ghana Gas to classify a company as an industrial company when you have VRA and you decide you won't do that to VRA. And once he's the head of the economic management team, he ought to bear responsibility for the decisions of the economic management team. That is one. Two is that the PURC is the economic regulator. It's the duty of the PURC to ensure that there's financial viability in the sector. And so for me, and I made this very clear yesterday at the meeting, that apart from the PURC, no other governmental entity has a right to step in and begin to vary prices, unless that entity makes it absolutely clear that it is subsidized and will therefore pay for the difference. When we do that, I'm sure we will make some progress. What are you looking forward to as Ghana Gas comes before the Parliamentary Committee? What are your expectations? I have a plethora of questions. I have a plethora of questions for them. I have a plethora of questions for the PURs, and more importantly, for government itself. I mean, it, a lot of things doesn't make sense for me, and we need to investigate those issues. Uh, right. They are not, you see, finally, finally, I think that ideally, GMPC's function should end at the flange when they discharge the raw gas. Because like crude oil, when they sell crude oil, what happens to the crude oil in terms of finished products, be it petrol, be it diesel, they don't go following up on that. So why is it that when it comes to gas, they want to get into isopentase, they want to get into what happens at the downstream level. When you do that, GMPC loses focus. And so I think that the, that decision by the economic management team was a very, very bad decision. And that is the cause of the problems we are facing today. 
Hopefully, when uh, further engagement happens with, uh, between the GNPC, Ghana Gas, and uh, the Parliamentary Select Committee, we'll get some more details on this and remedy the situation if possible. Mr. Jinapo, we are grateful for your time. Uh, John Jinapo is a former Deputy Power Minister. Let me wrap the conversation with Benjamin Boache of ASEP. Your final take. No, I think, Ben, the sad reality uh, is that the regulators don't have power. And it's the decisions of ministers that really define how things are done. And that is why you have, you know, Energy Commission writing to say that they are not aware of any policy to discount, uh, you know, tariff for some specific uh, industries, even when it had been done already. Um, we need to respect the functions of those institutions and reduce the role of the ministry and ministers to policy coordination and initiation. It doesn't mean that they should just sit down every day and just be writing policy documents. They need to consult, they need to engage to stress test decisions before it becomes policy. But it appears that is not what is being done. So PRC approved his own tariff, you know, by commingling all the gas. And somebody has taken part of the gas and selling at a discount. So how do we ensure that the sector is optimized? And these are the problems that Ghana faces today. And as we speak, the energy sector is indebted, you know, to the tune of over, you know, $2 billion. Even this year alone, they have accumulated about $1.4 billion as of now. All right? So if we continue to take these poor decisions, then the debt accumulation will persist and the citizens will have to pay instead of getting development uh, from the taxes that we pay uh, uh, to our government. Mr. Wache, grateful that you could uh, take the time to join us as well. All right. And that is Benjamin Boache of ASAP. Now, having spoken about uh, gas and GENSA and the GNPC and all the other dynamics, uh, we're going to take a bit of a breather. But when we return, we're going to be talking football. It has to do with our national team, the Black Stars, as they get ready for Qatar 2022. They've been lacing their boots. They were thrashed by the Seleção, the Samba Boys of uh, Brazil, by three goals to nothing. Then we played Nicaragua yesterday. Uh, a better performance, but we still aren't putting the ball behind the net. Only one goal was the difference between a very low-rated Nicaraguan team. Up next, we face high-placed Switzerland. How is the cookie going to crumble? What can we expect? Muftar Nabila Abdullahi and his team will be assessing that on the AM show right after the break. You're welcome back to the AIM show. Time now to talk about Africa Rising 5 and the IAA is organizing a two-day discussion on purpose-driven brands. Joining us is Noor Kodua, who's the Vice President and Area Director, IIA Africa, and she joins us via Zoom. Good morning. Good morning, my dear. How are you? Hope you're well. Fine, thank you. And good morning to your wonderful viewers across the world, I hope. Yeah, all right. So let's talk about who or what is the IIA. IAA. The, yes, the IAA is International Advertising Association. Mm -hmm. And it's a one of a kind um, organization that brings together advertisers, um, agencies, communication specialists, the media, academia to champion the cause of the Marcom industry on a global platform. Okay. And this year we have a conference happening. Let's talk about this year's conference. Yes. So this year, um, the IAA through its Africa network has been organizing Africa Rising for the past, what, um, seven years? Last year was a virtual um, conference because of the pandemic, but this year we're having a hybrid conference, so it's 
physical and virtual. Um, it's a flagship um, platform for the IAE where on the African continent we try to pull our resources together, we try to bring on board and uh, seasoned uh, speakers and professionals to help discuss the, um, the, the what we call development of our industry. Mm -hmm. And for us this year, we are focusing on brands for purpose, brands for people. We realized that last year, after we said Africa to the world, mm -hmm. it's time for us now to look at how brands have evolved and come up with different strategies across the continent to be able to stand tall and to be able to make any meaningful impact on the consumer. Mm. So we're bringing together over 30 speakers, seasoned speakers, okay. from the global perspective as well as from um, the region and Ghana specifically over the two days. Can you please share who some of the speakers are? Um, from the speakers, we have um, the group, um, we have Declan, um, what do you call, Declan from um, Brand Finance. As you're aware, this conference is in partnership with Women in Africa, okay. Women in Marketing Africa, Brand Finance, and we're creating a platform for Brand Finance to actually launch their, um, what do you call their, Globe, the Africa report of 150 brands. Mm -hmm. We have um, a fantastic speaker called um, Gabor George um, Bert. He is very known for his slingshot um, strategy, and he will be on the, 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 the first day to sort of talk about unleashing creativity mm -hmm. and aligning black brands with people. We have speakers from Dan Cote Group who okay. are familiar are a strong brand for Africa, and we're hoping we can get the hope, the Alaji himself to feature on the spot. Mm -hmm. We have um, speakers from Magdan, our own um, um, colleague. Mm -hmm. We have Mark Mensa, we have Kichi um, of um, what do you call of Ghana Commodities Exchange, and so many other speakers. Over thirty of them descending upon Accra to be able to. Um, provide two days of thought-provoking and insightful discussions around brands and how purposeful brands are, are becoming to consumers. All right, so tell us when and where it's happening. It's happening in the Labadi Beach Hotel from the 4th and the 5th of um, October. That's just next week, Tuesday and Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And um, this will be uh, the opportunity for Joel, our own Joel Neti, who Neti, who's the world president and chairman of the IAA. He'll be handing over to the senior vice president, Sassan Saidi, mm -hmm. and he will be also um, speaking as well. So Joel will be handing over to Sassan, and Sassan is of the Wyndham uh, Man Thompson Group, the agency group, and he will be talking with Islam from global um, Coca-Cola creative platform. So if one of our viewers is eager to come to the conference, how do they sign up? Um, you can get on the phone and call 020-958-0848 or contact the um, AAG, that's the Advertising Association, um, sectariat where the IE Ghana chapter is, or contact Lawrence at IAAAfrica.org. Um, so these are the opportunities, and um, we're looking forward to having CMOs, CEOs. We're looking forward to enticing um, marketing um, professionals. We're looking at the media fraternity partnership. We are in partnership with the CIMG, mm -hmm. so we are hoping that they can send delegates of um, professionals in us and, and the Association of Ghana Industries. And we're hoping that we can get as many participants as possible to come and be a part of the two days, um, what we call exciting discussions around brands and how brands are unleashing different. Um, strategies to appeal more to consumers mm. under these current circumstances. 
Apart from the insightful conversations that will be taking place, what can participants expect from the two-day conference? Well, I think networking is quite critical. And um, what um, the IA is looking at um, trying to establish um, strong partnerships across the um, continent. So networking is critical. Mm -hmm. I believe that once um, you hear the story of some some brands and some strategies that are, are what you call are being successful in various ways. It, it gives you some insights on what to do for your own business or your own career. So I think come network, come and listen, mm -hmm. come and pick up um, opportunities to um, go further. But most importantly, come and join the IAA. And we're looking at opening our arms to um, attract new uh, membership um, across all the various sectors of the Marcom industry. So before I let you go, please just share the number with us again. 020-958-0848. And um, we were looking forward to having the phone buzzing constantly and receiving as many participants for this conference as possible. I mean, um, it is going to be fantastic. Mm -hmm. We have shown over the years that we bring only quality and insightful um, um, conferences to Ghana. And um, this is another opportunity post-COVID. And we think there are so many opportunities and so many ideas and strategies moving around that you can get some insights for your business or for your professional development. Thank you very much, Vice President and Area Director of IAA Africa, Norco Duarte. Yeah. Thank you so much. That conference will take place on the 4th and 5th of October at the Labadi Beach Hotel. So make sure you do join them. Now, let me come back to studio and World Institute for Africa Action Learning. Ghana is also celebrating the WIAL Global Action Learning Week from the 26th to the 30th of September at the local level for two days. And Thursday 29 and Friday 30 September. Now, Action Learning is the world's number one methodology for solving real problems, challenges facing businesses, organizations and communities. The theme for the celebration is Discover Meaning. Discover Connection and Discover Action Learning. And joining me for this conversation is the Country Director for WIAL, Ghana, Emmanuel Osum. Good morning, sir. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. How All are right. you doing? I'm great, thank you. Wonderful. Now, let's talk about action, action learning and what it is. Thank you very much. Good morning to I mean, um, your uh, colleagues here and everyone else listening to us. Action learning... Um, is the world's you know, leading methodology mm -hmm. for solving all kinds of business challenges, um, and problems, and whatever. Um, it involves you know, it's a small team mm -hmm. you know, working on a problem, and at the same time, they are developing their leadership competences. And first, you, they have to ask you know, insightful questioning okay. to understand the true nature of the problem okay. before taking action. And simultaneously, whilst this is happening, it is also accelerating the individual, the team, and the organizational, you know, uh, the organization learning you know, capabilities. Mm. Um, actually, learning does not solve problems that are simple. Okay. It doesn't solve problems, uh, puzzles. It solves problems that are complex, that are real, mm -hmm. that are urgent. Uh, problems that, when solved, would then deliver to the company. I mean, whoever the clients or uh, is, is, you know, mm -hmm. substantial returns on investment. Okay. Um, action learning, you know, has two ground rules. And uh, before, you know, we can embark upon any action learning section, mm -hmm. uh, two ground rules have to be made known to the participants. And uh, the first one is that you don't, you have to, you know, only make. A statements in response to a question. Only make a statement in response to the question. Yes. Okay, like I just did now. Yes. Okay. Exactly. In other words, what it means is that questions must be first asked about the situation, the issue you want to, you know, uh, look at. Okay. Before 
statement from you know members involved can can okay. be made. Okay. And one question can elicit you know many you know statements. Mm -hmm. And but what is important here is that whatever statements that are being made in response to the question that has been asked, the statement must just address the you know exactly the question that has been asked. Okay. And you know the responses to the, the question must be very concise. Okay. Very concise. Would you like to give us an example of that? How would it play out in a action learning session? So, for example, if I ask you, how are you doing okay. in this company? I'm doing well, thank you. Uh, so, so uh, in what areas, at uh, what levels are you doing well? I'm doing well in my presentation skills. Uh, I'm doing well in my attendance. Uh, what, what are some achievements that you made? I have hosted various shows. I have been given more responsibilities. Uh, what, what do you t intend to improve upon? I, improve on, I intend to improve on my reading and my knowledge. Good. Okay. So these are so very well. You've done very well. Yeah. You have been very, you know, uh, uh, precise with okay. your responses, and that's great, great thing. Okay. But that's what actually learning does. Okay. Uh, so um, apart from that, the other ground rule is that it it speaks to the role of the coach. The role. In of the, the world, there are other organizations that use actual learning, mm -hmm. but they don't use coach. In the wild action learning approach, which is the World Institute for Action Learning, mm -hmm. we use a certified coach. So the coach during the action learning process, he moderates everything. Mm -hmm. He does not directly participate in the problem identification and solution. Okay. What he does is that he has to, you know, just keep the people involved on their toes. Okay. He manages their time, um, asks questions as and when necessary for yeah. you know the team involved to you know, be able to learn something mm. uh, of importance with you know, the process that is being you know, uh, uh, gone through. Yeah. yeah, so that's what a coach does. Uh, why do, you, we, do we use questions? Mm -hmm. uh, we use questions because uh, questions you know, uh, help people. There are three you know, fundamental roles that questions play mm -hmm. in solving problem. One of them is that it helps the group to be creative. Creativity. And then to achieve breakthrough thinking and solution. Okay. The problem that is being identified and solved. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that it keeps the group involved in solving the problem, mm. uh, focused and productive. And the third thing is that it helps in developing the leadership capabilities of okay. the members that are involved in solving the problem. Yeah. Okay. Good. Now, l let's talk about, you say you have solved complex problems and uh, global action is about solving problems. What, what problems have you solved? Well, um, uh, the problems that uh, we've, we've solved so far, it all depends on the organization that is involved. Okay. So, uh, for example, we have clients that are, I know, um, have been involved in helping them, you know, solving their, solve their problems. Mm -hmm. uh, clients around the world like um, uh, NASA, like uh, Boeing, like uh, Facebook, okay. like, uh, IBM, okay. Microsoft, Caterpillar, General Motors, mm -hmm. and, and Air China, you know, and, and, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So each of these organizations have their own peculiar world problems. Okay. Uh, we have um, a, and a link, or when you go to our website, for example, it's a place where we call the uh, testimonials. So we go to that, that site or mm -hmm. that, that place on the website, then it takes you to uh, you know, understand uh, what problems that you know, uh, actually learning has been used mm -hmm. to solve for those you know, individual mm -hmm. companies. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about this year's theme. It's discover meaning, discover connection, uh, discover action learning. Please elaborate and tell us more about it. Yeah, this. so um, when we say discover meaning, uh, a, a problem in an organization you know, um, might have many parts of it. Mm -hmm. In the traditional approach to problem solving, any problem that comes, they just they think that it's a bad thing, they have to get rid of it as soon as possible. But in action learning, we, we got to, you know, look at the root cause of the problem. Mostly what organizations call their problems are not their problems. Okay. They are the same things in the problem. Okay. So for us, in act, you know, as action learning practitioners, we, we got to go to the bottom of the problem. That is the discovery of the meaning here. Now, when that is identified, we then also have to work, fix a solution. Mm -hmm. And then we look at a solution from a system thinking perspective. What, you know, what would the solution mean 
for the different aspects of the organization. Mm -hmm. For example, we might do something here at the studio, uh, but then we are not looking at it just from the uh, perspective of you know, its inferences on, on the studio here, mm -hmm. but the entire, you know, you know, how do you call it, joint news organization. Mm -hmm. So that is the, the discover meaning aspect. Now, when we say discover connection, mm -hmm. again, uh, it, it relates to the system thinking approach. Okay. Now, the problem that we have, what are the various you know, elements or facets of the organization that are connected to this problem? Mm -hmm. that, that there must be a link. For example, an organization, a, you know, a, a, a company is suffering you know, employee turnover. Mm -hmm. Okay, the employee turnover might not necessarily be the fault of the HRO. Okay. It could also be something somewhere else. And so we've got to get to see what are the issues that are connected to this very thing. Maybe like a management issue. The management issue, uh -huh. salary issue. Salary issue. Or probably the time, time. they come to work. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Or Working conditions. That kind of thing. Or yeah. the work is not encouraged. It's not challenging them. Okay. These things are important. If we don't discover these connections, this meaning, mm -hmm. and we just solve the problem as we see it, are the other connections will not be noticed. And they won't be solved. They will not be solved. Yeah. So would have just addressed some small aspect of the, you know, the true problem or the entire problem. And what that would mean is that because we've just addressed some aspect of it, mm -hmm. and, and you know, about two months or one year down the line, the problem that we have sat down, we spent time and resources to solve, we begin to resurface. Okay. Because we have not discovered the connections. Mm -hmm. And that is what is done in the traditional problem solving approaches. But in actual learning, you know, we might once first see how you know, various aspects of a particular problem are connected and then address them as well. All right. Uh, so before I let you go, this year's celebration, yeah. two days, 29th and 30th of September, is there anything that you're doing? Yeah, so uh, for this uh, uh, conference, which is taking place tomorrow and you know fr Friday at mm -hmm. the BAM Library, University of Ghana, you know, uh, conference you know room, mm -hmm. uh, we we'll, we want to showcase to the world, want to showcase to Ghanaians, uh, businesses, mm -hmm. organizations, and and every everyone else communities, uh, what actual learning is, is all about, mm -hmm. and why they need to embrace actual learning mm -hmm. because there is no any approach to solving complex problem mm -hmm. better today in the world than wild action learning. So we'll bring people together, they'll have the opportunity to see uh, testimonials you know, okay. you know, of people who have embraced action learning. Mm. They'll watch videos, there'll be um, you know, activities that you know, would engage mm. the participants you know, to have a real feel of what action learning is like. Uh, and then there'll be networking events and other things. And what we are going to do as well is we are raging for Companies, real clients, real companies have real problems, so they bring their problems there. And I am a certified accident coach as well. I was certified in the United States. Okay. So I'll be leading a team of you know uh, participants. Okay. And just we're going to have just one you know person or two people who have their problems. So they will present their problems. But okay. then I will get a team because accident learning requires a minimum of four people. Uh, from diverse background and a mm -hmm. maximum of eight people or from diverse background to solve to sit around the table to solve the problem but then there must be the coach so that's going to be my role so tomorrow for example tomorrow and thursday um real clients are going to be presenting their real problems okay. and i as a coach with the, some of the participants and also the owner of the problem i mean the one who is you know facing the problem in his organization is, is going to be part of the team and then through you know insightful questionings we are able to you know, uh, uh, unravel the root cause of the problem and fix strategic you know, solutions. Solutions. How do we sign up? Is it free? It's totally free. Okay. This is free. Uh, so whoever you know, is interested, we've sent, you know, I'd call it, we've taken some companies already. Okay. Um, and so we are still inviting people to come because it's, it's a new thing in this part of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the second in Africa, uh, is, we have one in Nigeria. Okay. And, uh, and the whole continent, apart from Nigeria and Ghana, we don't have actually any in the world. But That's this is a, 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 an organization that has been in existence already since the early 1940s. And in the Western world, that actually is a tool they use to do everything. Mm. Not only solve a problem, but actually it could, uh, could be used as well to define a project. Mm. Okay. For example, your organization, you are wondering what project to do. You are not sure. But yeah. with actually learning, you are able to do that. It could be issues, that kind of thing. Yeah, so uh, people are welcome to sign up. Uh, they can only call us to, to do that. And that is okay. They can come. There's no payment for you know, uh, uh, participation in the conference. Mm -hmm. Is there a number they can call? 
Yeah, okay, we can give a number. Okay, yeah. yeah. So uh, the number is 055 1685 Please repeat it. Okay, 055 1685 Okay, that's the number yeah. to dial if you want to yes. join the Global Good. Action Learning Week. Thank you so exactly. much. Uh, the, right. my, studio, my studio guest was mm -hmm. Imano Song, who's the country director of WIAL Ghana. You're still watching the AM show. We're going to take a quick breather. We'll be back with audience. <laughs> And we're doing audience interactions <laughs> in this life. What is it? Is it, is it? is it the look on my face? It's not the or look what on your is face. It that is? Uh, it, it's the look on the viewer's face. Um, okay. you, so, you can see that? Yes, I can. Oh, wow. My, my, my fans are, are, are texting me. Okay. Yeah, so we're doing audience interactions. So, uh, Abendal, we're waiting for your call. Abendal, let's see, let's see whether he can make it today. Let's I mean, how many times running? This would be about six or seven, seven times yeah, yeah, yeah. running. So he, should we get, get him a prize or something for always being the first I, I think so. Maybe like mm. in December he should come and join the show for maybe like the news review. Or even know, not, right? not, not even in studio, he can join it via uh, Zoom. That's, that's actually a brilliant idea. I, I, I think yeah. it would also be lovely to like, you know, involve our audience members mm. in like something like the news review. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting Once to in hear their views. Once in a while we pick one yeah. or two. The, 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 the problem is uh, seasoning, you know, whatever they are going to say, at least the guests we book and all of that, you know where they're going to go, even if they go off track a bit, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Sometimes with some of these people, you don't know what their, their full opinions are and they may say something that doesn't sit well. With. But but it's, yeah. it's it's actually a good idea. Like on a Friday, every, every Friday. I think it'll mm. be interesting. You know yeah. what? As you call through and share your thoughts, share with us what you think about that suggestion. Do you like that suggestion? Anyway, apart from that, we've also been talking about the Ghana gas situation. GNPC, Ghana gas now being summoned. The PURC is in there. It has to do with Jensa and that deal. Of course, Parliament's uh, committee... Energy and Mines Committee is still looking into that uh, matter. We had an interaction uh, earlier on that. You can share your thoughts on that. We've also had the football conversation, or the mm -hmm. footballing conversation, and um, Muftaw Nabila Abdullahi was on hand. What do you think? What are the prospects of the Black Stars from where you sit or stand, <laughs> whether at home or in your office or wherever? Share your thoughts with us. We've also had other conversations. So where do you sit? When it comes to the Black Stars? I think I was just sharing with uh, the crew back, you know, stage with the director, the producer. I don't think we have a bad team. I think we actually have a good team individually. But it now, you know, it's like cogs in a wheel. Mm -hmm. How they'll come together, uh, how they will gel ahead of Qatar mm. is the problem. I think we'll see our true size. I, I don't think... Playing against Brazil was a fair reflection of where exactly we are. I think Switzerland, looking at the way they play, strength and pace, I think they will actually let us know our true smoothness level ahead of uh, Qatar 2022. But we have a first caller, Mapito. Al Alvin from Accra, I think we might have jinxed uh, um, Abindal ah, by, by, maybe. by hoping that he will be the first caller. But Alvin from Accra, good morning. Alvin? Yeah. So what I would like you to do is turn down the volume of your television set. I would really, really appreciate it if you did that. Please, come again, come again. So turn down the volume of your television set. Oh, okay, okay. Sure, cool. All right, you can share your thoughts now. You mean I can talk now? I mean, if you want to talk, if you want to sing, yes, but you can show your thoughts. thoughts you have, do share them with us. Uh, connect me to the radio, please. To Kojo. 
Okay, so mm -hmm. I think this was meant for our radio program, the mm -hmm. Super Morning Show. Uh, you've connected to the TV program, Joy News. So we'll just remedy that. I think you got the wrong line, but it's okay. I think that is why he got through first. Yeah. So let's see. So this will not count. This will not count. This will not count. Okay. Let's see whether we'll still get Abindao. If Abindao nails it, we might contemplate something, yeah? 0302-211-691 extension 2. 0302-211-691 extension 2. What are your thoughts? You were asking me about the black sauce. The star. black sauce, yeah. Like I said, I think we have a good team. In fact, people may not see this for now, but when I look at the Salisus, the Kuduses, the, um, the um, what's his name? Oh, how come his name? Apart from Andre Ayu, and I, I do feel, though, that Andre Ayu should still be in the team. He has that experience. He has that clout. He's played in the World Cup. Mm -hmm. In fact, two, if I'm not mistaken. And, he, and of course, you, you cannot take away the junior World Cup he played, uh, which Ghana won. I think this was 2008, 2009. And other dynamics. He's the most senior player in there for us now. I feel this crop can replicate what the Sule Montares and Michael Essians did. They just need that coordination and uh, to stop being selfish. We saw a bit of that yesterday with Inyaki and uh, Afenajan in the strikers department. We can do something. But well, we have Clifford in Kaswa. Hello, Cliff. Yes, good morning. Uh, pardon my shortening your name. So, Clifford, good morning. What is good your morning, team? Sir. Yes, um, my take on the team is um, I think for the team, individually, we have the players. But uh, for teamwork, that's where the problem is. Mm -hmm. For instance, yesterday, when you look at it, when you watch the match, right. mm -hmm. example, Kudus, he's holding on to the ball. That's a problem for me alone. Inak would give a nice run for him yeah. to just pass the ball, yeah. for the guy to do his job. He's holding on to the ball for what? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think for, for, for individually, we have the players, but it left... For the players to understand that this is a teamwork. Mm. Pass the ball. Where are you going? Just leave the ball for next player to play. Like, free the ball. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's where the problem is. They should understand that they are a team. And they should work as a team. Period. We have the players. Inaki Williams. Look at what he was doing yesterday. So nice. So lovely. I love that guy so much. Mm. And he's doing the job. I mean, we have Sally Suit. I mean, the boys are there. They should just understand that this is a team. We are here to work as a team. That yeah. is it. And we'll go. Thank you very much. Enjoy Cliff, your day, sir. Right. Uh, you have an enjoyable day, too. He, he just re-echoes my sentiments. Yeah. We have stellar individual players. Some of them need to, uh, you know, up their game a bit. But the point is, I, I don't know whether it's because of, you know, we're trying this fusion of the, um, the new players, mm -hmm. the Tariq Lamptes, the Iñaki Williamses, and others. And, uh, you know, the foreign, those of foreign extraction who just joined the Ghana team, merging them with our Black Star, you know, team already, those plying their trade abroad and bringing in someone like Bania, who is a local player. I think that mix is what Otoado has a lot of work um, to do with. But if we're able to get it right, I suggest we'll give the teams at the World Cup a rough time. For their money, yeah. And he mentioned something about teamwork, and I think it's something that uh, cuts across in all of our sectors. Teamwork and collaboration is something that really lacks, mm. especially also when you look at the creative industry, is that people just want to be the, you know, the person who scores. Yeah. You know, yeah, you are, Benjamin yeah. is the one who scored. But yeah. if we work together, mm. we can get like three goals or four goals. Right. Same thing in the creative industry. People enter rooms you know, with like really big uh, um, personalities, but they never bring each other up. You know, it's a, it's a really sad thing. It's even with the whole conversation that was happening with the Global Citizen, that Asha uh, brought the Nigerian artist. Mm. What about the Ghanaian artist? Yeah. But the thing is that some of these Ghanaian artists, the managers are in these big rooms, but the managers are not speaking for you. Yeah. They're not, you know, talking yeah. on your behalf. So um, I think teamwork, collaboration is something that we have to really work on. Uh, as Ghanaians. A few things come to mind. It's been said that for some people, especially in our part of the world, yeah. when they get to the top, the ladder they climbed, they, they break it or move it away so no one else can climb to where they've got to. But, but that's a very backward mentality. It's like with children. I grew up realizing that 
you know, for my father that where he had got to, we have to go even higher. higher yeah. And that should always be, it doesn't matter, but you're, you're very right. It's, it's, like, it's, it's mm -hmm. a mentality that, especially in our football, you know, I must score the goal. Yeah. I must, it must be my name out there. In the last, in the 2010 World Cup in South Africa, some have suggested that was what cost us. I must score. Yeah. My name must be there. Eventually, we came back home. Yeah, it's like a uh, legendary South African uh, actor, John Carney, said, uh, once your elevator gets to the top, make sure that you press G. Yeah, ground floor. So it comes ground back floor, down so to pick comes, someone else. Yeah, so yeah. yeah, that's something that we need to learn. But the number to dial is 030 221 That's the number to dial. We want to hear your thoughts on the conversation so maximum, we've had so far. Maximum two minutes more if you want to call. Abendal, we're still not heard from you today. If you want to share your thoughts on these matters, uh, just call in now. Let's I hope he's well, though. And I hope he's I think okay. the last time he was talking about, I don't know whether it was electricity or something of the okay. sort. Okay. So I, I don't know. Maybe and his phone uh, battery died or something. But Abendal, wherever you are, we are very worried about you. Okay, I am worried about you. I hope you're fine, okay? I hope someone gets to tell him that, you know, the two hosts the AM show were fussing yeah. over him like we need to get his on a Wednesday full name. morning. His full name and a picture. I think he's in Kumasi or something. Yeah, he is in Kumasi. We need to find But we can go to, to Bolga and Jonas joins us. Jonas, good morning. Jonas, good morning. Good morning. Would you like to share your thoughts with us? Yes. Uh, yeah, I want to share my thoughts on last start's performance yesterday. Sure. Yeah, actually, uh, we need to commend Coach Otoado for uh, bringing the team that he used yesterday. Mm. Actually, uh, Daniel complained about the Brazil game with the crop of players he used, thinking we have players who can do much better. But yesterday's game shows that actually the formation used against Brazil is what causes not the individual players we use against Brazil. Because just when you look at the game, they play as a team in a way, but it's like what they are supposed to do, they couldn't do. Like Kudus was holding too much onto the ball. Inaki moved into spaces, but no one to supply. The same thing that we saw in our previous matches where people always lambast Jordan and you for not doing much. But in football, at times you are a striker and you need people to help you do your job. But if people cannot help you do your job, you, you just look like a spectator in the match. You see? So yesterday, Inaki just looked like somebody who is a spectator. But you know the capability of Inaki William. You could have done a lot more if you were giving the ball. And I also want to congratulate this, my boy. If I have to give that, I always say that. It's, it's, it's a natural talent. No matter what people say about this guy, not getting much playing time at uh, Lisbon. But this guy... Wh which talented. player are you referring to? What he did yesterday, they clearly show that. Out of the blue, he just did that ball. And you could see the, the, the incidents around the ball before he had the ball. About two Ghanaian players tried kicking the ball and they missed it. But when he had the ball, he just took his time and he knew what he wanted to do. Then... We had that goal, and that happened to be our only goal against Nicaragua. Just imagine. So yesterday, it, it, it's nice for Eduardo to use such a team, so that when he meets Switzerland, he now come out with, uh, with his probable 11. I think the next shouldn't complain. They should give him a break because he's the one doing the work. He knows the players. All right. In football, it's All not right. like that about All right. All right. holding on to the ball. But it's the commitment. You see? Some players okay, so we're, we're, don't we're, perform much, but when they come to the national team, their commitment and their motivation alone, they do one best and you, you marvel. So it's not that maybe somebody scoring at club level or doing one the best match. All right. Thank you uh, for your thoughts uh, there. A very passionate mm -hmm. fan of football, wanting things to go right. But on that footballing note, uh, we wrap the conversation. Of course, there'll be more talk ahead of the match against Switzerland. But from today, I am Benjamin Akaku. And I am Mapita Sibiri. Thank you so much. News Desk is up next with Samuel Kojo Brace.